Hello and welcome to the Nash Tackle Off The Hook podcast. Welcome back to our slightly makeshift COVID secure as can be studio. And once again, my apologies if there are any differentiations in sound and obviously the set, but we're here so we can keep bringing you the podcast. And we are back for part four with Kevin Nash himself. Kev, how are you, mate? I'm good, thank you. A little bit warmer than what it was last time. <laughs> thank goodness. Uh, hopefully that's the end of a really bad winter. Roll on spring, mate, is all I can Roll say. Roll on spring, get the rods out, eh? We're going to pick up from where we left off in part three. So we pretty much finished what was a series of different trips over time to, to Gran Canaria. But we're looking at around about sort of late 80s, early 90s. Early 90s now. Yeah, early 90s in terms of Nash Tackle. Um, talk to me about where exactly Nash Tackle is in this sort of early 90s period. And has Nash bait formed yet? It's, um, like I said, it's becoming a monster now. Um, mm. And sometimes in business, you know, your control is taken out of your hands. You know, um, And this was a classic example, carp fishing has taken off. And really, you know, I'm the only one. Um, yeah. other companies were just emerging you know, beginning to see the opportunity and copy me uh, particularly Fox and that but you know they say there's this big explosion in carp fishing and the pressure's on me to provide it uh, which part of the fact I didn't want it um, and I wasn't you know uh, like I said uh, uh, financially astute you know, yeah. so I didn't really just didn't know what I was doing um, it's always difficult you know, to manage uh, excessive growth. In fact, uh, they call it over-trading. You know, most companies, more companies go bust because they're too successful yeah. than they do because, they, you know, they can't get a sale. Yeah, and so I was in that kind of uh, place, um, really firefighting, as I say, trying to deal with running the company, which is uh, getting out of control, burgeoning, Whereas really all I wanted to do was go carp fishing. Please let me go carp fishing. I'm so loved going to Grand Canary. I want to see the rest of the world, you know. So, yeah, I really was an irresponsible uh, boss, I think. Really? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. In what so, way? Go on, give me, give me some more about Because well, selfishly, I didn't want to be there, you know. Yeah. So, you know, I still, I still wanted to be like Happy Hooker, where it just gave me a little bit of money to go carp fishing, you know. So I didn't want this big empire. You know, yeah, you know, it wasn't what I was about, and really, to this day, you know, um, I'm not about it. Um, the reason um, I'm more, fo- well, I'm a lot more focused on the business because at one point I realised how many uh, families relied on us. You know? Yeah. So you know, you either got you got to make your decisions, you know, t- take it serious because so many people are relying on you for a living, and stop being so bloody selfish or walk away from it. You know, so. Did yes. you at this stage? Did you ever think about walking away from it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. but I had nothing else to do. Uh, what I mean by that, I could have made a living uh, just being a, you know, a known angler. Well, yeah. I, know I was employed by Del uh, by Darwa. Oh, well, yeah. Um, I did consider um, just you know, fishing full time, but I realised I didn't want to fish full time. Um, I'd seen. I've seen the casualties, you know, I've seen, you know, believe it or not, no one, no one uh, fished full time, you know, until probably into the 80s, you know, it's the first time people were giving up jobs, yeah. you know, to go fishing. In fact, I'm not going to mention his name, but, you know, the first person I know who did it, we thought, you know, what the hell, you know, but, but um, I don't consider that is a, a, a fulfilled or satisfactory life, just being able to, fish all the time or or I even say do whatever you like when you want to do it you know, I think I don't think that's a fulfilled life I always used to say um, you know I'd be looking out my office window the conditions would be perfect but damn I can't go because I've got to work today you yeah know? and I think to maximize you know life and the fulfillment there's got to be times where you can't Get your own way. Yeah. And do your own thing. You know. I'm with you there. Yeah, you know, and uh, as I say, um, I certainly would not want to be fishing full time. You know, you know, what do you got to talk about? You're a boring person. You know, you're not you know, experiencing any other things in life. Uh, I just wanted to be full time at anything, you know, singly. You yeah. Know, I think you need that. Uh, you need the disciplines. Uh, you need 
not be able to get your own way. Uh, and then you can, it enhances the enjoyment of the experience of those pleasures. You know, it means so much to you, I think. You know? Yeah. So, so I decided no. Um, I didn't want to be a full time angler, uh, but no way did I want to go back into engineering. Yeah. You know? So I was kind of you know, stuck with what I had, I think. You know? And at this point, you've got Nash Tackle, you've had the whole catch them, split up all that stuff go on. Is it just Nash Tackle or is Nash Bait coming or? Nash Bait. This is around the time, yeah, um, you know, we're getting into early 90s now. Um, the splits happen with me and Rod. Yeah. So um, we're left, we catch him. He went and started, this is um, a new business, Rod Hutchinson. Yeah. Um, then there was huge, huge confusion over who had what. Um, the sales for us really dropped in the UK. Um, probably the biggest, biggest bait brand along with Richworth, you know, up until then. Um, and from my point of view, whether it was or not, I was concerned that it was beginning to impact on Nash, uh, i.e. You know, retailers expect to buy something off you that sells. Yeah. You know, and so you're fully responsible for that, not them. You know. It's a sort of strange thing, retail, fish and tackle retail. They just sit behind the counter most of the time, just waiting for someone to walk in and say, I'll buy that. Yeah. But, um, so I was worried that if the bait wasn't selling, they, it might you know, have an impact on uh, on the tackle. So Rob Malin, uh was really coming up then, especially the famous five. Yeah, and he was, you know, causing bedlam as well wherever he went. You know, Savvy, he calls massive bedlam. <laughs> uh, eventually, got chucked out. Then he come over to um, uh, Harefield, mm. so uh, yeah, he caused a bit of bedlam over there as well. <laughs> I mean, most of it after I left, but you know, um, I have a massive affection for Rob. By the yeah. way, um, I think he's been uh, much, if you like, unrecognised angler. Um, you know, he's written, I think, three books and they're fantastic reads, but he was also, you know, quite smart, very innovative. Um, so responsible for things like Swimmer Rig, you know, of course, the famous five, you know, he had some right, really good anglers around him. Uh, yeah. Lockie, Wibbly, uh, Phil Harper, you know, my dear, dear mate, you know, he's one of the famous five. Uh, and he was a big name then. Um, so we decided to launch, uh, Obsession, uh, Rob made him bait range, um, and it completely flopped. Yeah. Um, it was my first lesson in that you know you can be a big name, but it doesn't mean necessarily fishing tackle. Yeah, it takes a long, long time you know for a, a brand to be established, you know, and you know, or a name to be able to sell fishing tackle. You know, Terry Earns a classic example. Um, he was originally with Nash. Um, Jeff Pink, who found him um, on Yately, mm. a little group called the Munchings, and uh, so you got my Nash bait, and you know, we we nurtured um, Terry, and his first fifteen forties were caught on Nash bait, fourteen were caught on Monster Pacific, yeah, and yet their bait wasn't even in our top three bestsellers, <laughs> you know, because you know, Terry still wasn't, you know, of a of a level, or you know. Yeah. Been in it long enough where, you know, he could influence tackle or bait sales like he can now, you know. And I think the same with Rob. So that flopped. Um, How did that go down with Rob and you? Did you did you think that it would be... I thought it was going to be a massive yeah, success. Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah, I guess Rob did as well, but it didn't. But um, that's what it was, you know, Rob... Rob's very relaxed. You know, we never, if you, if we never had a fallout over it. Okay. You know, in fact, I've never fallen out with Rob, um, which is an odd because he's a bit of a stroke puller, I'll tell you. Uh, but um, <laughs> you know, so, um, yeah, I say, yeah, a big regard for him. In fact, we ought to try and get him on the podcast. Yeah, you know? we will. Um, yeah, so now we're stuck. And I actually said to Gary, I'm thinking of pulling the bait out of the UK. And we just um, said it in Europe because Rod's name you know, had been huge because of you know his time in France and that. Uh, so a lot of French and European anglers looked to him. So the sales were still good. In fact, um, a French ground bait company, Census, mm-hmm. uh, took us on 
Okay. Uh, so we've now got access to all their shops. We're selling them ridiculous numbers of flavours and all that. Yeah. What I didn't realise, they were just using us, you know, bloody ruthless. They're using us to find out what sold. And then next year they brought this bait range called Star Baits out. <laughs> And they even copy the recipes on the back of our bottles of bastards. Really? Yeah, yeah. So they can be pretty ruthless at times, the French. But um, yeah. So anyway, Gary, of course, you know, baits his game. You know, he's passionate about making it success. Um, so with him nagging me, I was out of desperation. I might just say, okay, then we have one more go. We call it Nash bait. And after I said it, I thought, what have I done? Um. So, yeah, we started preparing it. I'll never forget, we went over to um, Holland to do a, a weekend event there at a carp show. Uh, and on the ferry back, you know, it was a night ferry, we stayed up all night and um, I had this concept where we'd have two recipes, you know, because all you know, ingredients in. Yeah. yeah you know, they bought a base mix and then bought a bottle of flavour or whatever. And on the back of every uh, product, I wanted two recipes, a big fish recipe and an international recipe. Yeah. So, uh, you know, me and Gary made all those recipes on the way back. Wow. And that's what sense has copied. You know, when yeah. you saw the star baits, they always had a big fish in it. But, yeah, so we wrote them all in a week, did all the packaging that night on the way back. And then we launched it and um, the rest, as they say, is history. Yeah. I just didn't have to have any worries. Your phone never stopped ringing. A number of times I heard anglers on the phone say, well, the tackle's great, so the bait must be as well. Is that is that, that, that sort of reciprocal business, do you think? Because people have been so happy with the tackle that it was a natural thing to get on the bait as well. It was the first and only time it's ever happened in my life. It's you know. <laughs> uh, never happened since, you know, as I say. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, just, you know, the bait was rubber stamped by the tackle. Yeah, you know, there's just no doubt it's got to be good. You know, just people flocked in to buy it, you know. But in fairness, it was. You know, I used to, someone reminded me the other day, and I was, I was passionate about the product, uh, and I had 100% belief in it. You know, and yeah. I, I would still say to this day that if you put two angles of equal level alongside each other and give one Nash bait, and the other X bait, you know, that that Nash bait angler won't be beaten. And normally they're out fishing, you know, because there's no other bait company that's had the massive um, well of experience like you know Nash bait because you know it's got rod, yeah, you know, it's got rod behind it, you know, and, you know, and you know rod was rod was a lad, you know, so an absolute lad, but he was he was worshipped, yeah. Yeah, you know, and you know, by everyone. You know, I told you, you know, the problem I had at Hereford when I first arrived. You know, because mm-hmm. Rod was so worshipped. But the fact is, if anyone had um, a bait edge or an ingredient or whatever, they would tell Rod. You know, they yeah. want to give it to him. Rod have it. Yeah, you know, and so, so the carp world, you know, become you know Rod's you know um, source of you know so many ingredients that people have found. You know, and then I. I brought uh, quite a bit of stuff as well. Remember, you know, I had, I had my flavours and all that stuff and yeah. stuff we did, me and uh, Bill. So I we bought, I bought quite a lot. I bought the um, the carp crave. Yeah. Um, I, was, I had a friend who, um, well, let's say a friend, a friend in, uh, introduced me to a guy who worked, it was a salesman for a company that made um, specialist additives to uh, induce animals to feed after weaning that were difficult you know and they did a lot of work with zoos and all that yeah yeah and that's how um we you know i've come up with the super sense you know things like that the carp craze so we both brought a lot to a party you know, and, and you know really you know nash bait was and still to this day is a you know, pretty unique company it's got the biggest uh, source of information in fact we got a bait yeah. book we got a bait book you know if we if we <laughs> If we launch the baits that are in that, we probably have enough, enough baits for the next five centuries. Yeah. You know, um, it's impressive. I, I, I remember my induction here, mate. I went round the factory, and it's just ridiculous, mate. Um, as you say, years of experience. Gary is just an absolute. Oh, it's a science, isn't it? It's not. Mm. It's not. It's not even. Yeah, making baits a complete science. But around this time, when it's sort of forming, and you've launched Nash, Nash bait, there's only really Richworth in the picture. Is there as another? 
sort of rival bait brand? Or is there anybody else? Um, Richworth are kind of different because those ready mates. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Rod had uh, yeah. developed a machine, uh, but it wasn't very good, or they never, it, neither him or Gary or any of them never sorted out the base mixes that would go for the machine properly. Okay. So we were about um, base mixes and additives and rolling your own bait. Yeah. Whereas uh, Rich were from more ready. about the ready made. You then had um, Fish Meal Premier. They um, they they come from nowhere uh, in the late eighties. Uh, the Premier Boys yeah. and loads of um, anglers got on. You know the Fish Meals, Nod Oil, and all that. Yeah, yeah. You know, that, that's where uh, you know the massive soaking baits in fish all started. You know you, see, you, know, you go over Harefield, there could be foot high waves, and they'd be. Sticking out the baits and it'd be, be calm like a toy cannon, you know, <laughs> a big tanker that sank, you know, that was um, that was the start with that era. Yeah. What about your fishing then in the UK around this time, if you've obviously the limited time you've got with the expansion of Nash Tackle and Nash Bait? I think um, Canary's really focused on me again. Mm. Uh, you know, what I really wanted to do was catch carp, but... Um, more in solitude, you know. Um, I'd heard that um, the River Blackwater in Suffolk had produced a scrape of 30 pound common, yeah, okay. and I'd kind of been directed to the area. Never proved if it was true, but I was certain there definitely was fish over 20, and I just kind of really fancied trying to catch a river carp. Um, so, had you ever caught a river carp before? No, 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 very few people had. So, yeah, I spent um, summer up there, lovely summer. Um, never saw another angler. Yeah. And, you know, so, uh, it was really interesting. Um main thing I learned was that carp at the end of the day avoid humans. <laughs> um, you know, I think I can relate that. We can all relate that if we think about it to lakes. If there's a you know, an out-of-bounds area, that's where they will live. You know, they only let move out of it when you know there's no food left. And they, you know, Harefield, for example, they lived in the middle, basically mm. out of out of casting range or you know, uh, been out of um, land and range. You know, been down that route, and they just sit in the middle until they were so hungry they had to go on a lap of the lake to get food. And they go and sit back in the river, and there's no different in the river. Eventually, big thing about river carp is finding them. Yeah. And I eventually found them uh, in numbers, uh, and they was between. They was in a piece of river uh, with private banks both sides. Yeah, uh, you couldn't get to them I, from downstream. I could cast to them, but there was a telegraph wire, uh, pile, no electric pylon wire going across the river. It looked miles up, but however I did it, I couldn't do that cast without going over it. Really? Yeah, I did catch um, one uh, in the end uh, from a weir pool. And that's that is my only uh, store carp, but yeah, wow. but yeah, I love the experiences. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, I really I think you know what am I about? It's uh, about adventuring and exploring. You know, um, I think that's rubbed into Alan as well. Yeah, uh, you know, you know, Nash Bait is the adventure company. I think, <laughs> you know, you know, not sit on a day ticket water behind three rods. You know, yeah. Um, but yeah, I did. Um, did a summer on there, and like I said, I'm still dabbling on the snake pit, but it just got ridiculously hard um, for a number of reasons. So just popping in and out, if conditions look good, um, craving to go abroad well, yeah. more. Yeah. Um, I was contacted by a golf company. A golf company? Mm, okay. Who who um selling golf holidays in Portugal. Um and they wanted to start carp fishing on the days if there was a market there. Right. They knew there was carp in Portugal. Um, so, in essence, they paid for me to go over there uh, for a week, gave me a villa and everything, took friends, actually. Nice. And Gary Bays, and uh, yeah, we wrecked that. Bays, he's done well out of this uh, <laughs> fledging relationship, hasn't he, mate? You know, what I always say about Gary... You know, um, t- 
taken over Catch and we've mm. uh, nearly bankrupted Nash. Yeah. Um, you know, I just never understood, you know, someone offers you something on a plate doesn't necessarily mean it's, you know, a good deal. And it nearly uh, bankrupt in Nash, and you know, it cost me 180 grand, which is a serious amount of money. Is that what it cost? Yeah, probably, I don't know, three quarters of a million now, you yeah. know, equivalent to a uh, turn, catch and round. And then they say, we you know, broke up, we robbed, blah, blah, and always said, the only thing I ever got out of it was Gary Bays. Was that a good <laughs> deal? <laughs> yeah, bless him. Yeah. Bless him. But uh, no, all joking aside, um, it's very lonely at the top in business, you know, um, and you know, Gary, Gary was by my side. Uh, for many, many years, utterly infuriating, uh, caused us no end of nightmares. Yeah. Um, I just think it's on the. Mean? Here we go. This sounds. This sounds entertaining, well, mate. Uh, here's one story then, <laughs> which probably no one's heard. Um, uh, we had a blackmail situation. Right. He took this guy on, uh, kind of as a right hand man. And um, he basically uh, stole the bait book, right? You know, the, the book, the magic book I told you about with yeah. all the recipes. And uh, he then held us to ransom to get the bait book back. And I was incensed. And so I picked up the phone to the police. And the next thing I know, um, two, three coppers have arrived, you know, screeching car, Jack, I think it was. You know, uh, turned up, come rushing the door. Uh, it was like the, the flying squad, yeah. right? You know, they they started tapping uh, the, uh, the put equipment on the phones. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so um, we had to wait until he uh, rang. <laughs> you know, and uh, you know, he was going to tape it, and then uh, yeah, uh, they was going to nick him. Really serious offence. You know, and, uh, yeah. yeah. Fuck me, we're talking about a bait book here. But, yeah, like, yeah, police are involved. You know, big blackmail case, and the bloke's going to go away for life or whatever. You yeah. know. So yeah, that's you know, there's a lot of stories like that. Cause, you know, Gary, if I had to make an observation at Gary, he's very naive because he's so honest. Yeah. You know, and just, you know, just a nice, honest guy. And he just doesn't understand how horrible and ruthless people can be. Mm. You know, um, there's a certain other guy very close to me who um, started ringing Gary up, just talking about bait. And then I found out he was uh, starting another, starting a bait company. And I rang Gary and Gary went all silent. Yeah, you know, he'd been tapping him up for months on, you know. You know so, Gary you know, being Gary. G- Gary being Gary just wouldn't think, hang on. Yeah, you know, you know, that's how it was, you know. But, but yeah, I'd well, say. So, um, yeah. Well, he, he is a character. You know, and an awesome angler, mate. Bloody awesome angler as well. Yeah. yeah. I, um, not a big fish angler. Um, it takes a long time to work it out. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, he, you know, he took a long time to get the Annie, but he caught her. And the same with, um, you know, Two-Tone. You know, you know Nash Bait can be very proud, by the way, that um, it's the only company uh, where the owners caught uh, a British record. Yeah. Um, oh, he Gary Bay's caught Two-Tone. And it's the first time it's caught over £60, you know. And uh, that's a lovely story, actually. You know, I'm not going forward and jumping here, but um, I was in China uh, on business and... I got a phone call, I think it was about three, four, three or four o'clock in the morning. Don't forget China's eight hours ahead. Yeah. And it was Dave Jordison, you know, well-known Essex angler. And he rang me up to say, Gary's just you know, broken the uh, British record. Yeah. Two tons, 60 blah, blah. So I've straight away got on the phone to Gary and, um, you right, mate? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well done, blah, 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 blah. I can't believe blah, 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 blah. And I, I'm talking to him for two, three minutes, and he's very, very Tyson. You know, he was clearly like, you know, in shock, if you like. Yeah. And he just turned and said, "Sorry, who am I talking to?" <laughs> I mean, Gary, you're talking to Kevin. He went, "What? You ringing me from China? I can't believe." You know, so he was just. Yeah. He wasn't on the planet. He was just so spaced out, so spaced out. Yeah. And just a story of that capture. Yeah. You know, he's, you know, he's typical Gary. You know. Um, I don't know whether he's ever told it, is he? But we're, we're going to line him up, mate, and get him. to Okay, I'm not. I'm not going to tell you about it, but you know, make sure you ask him you know, about the, 
when you hooked it and getting in the boat and everything. Because you know, it's, it's, it's a great story and typical Gary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. So we talked about, obviously, your, your guys' relationship, a lot of travelling and, and trips together. You were talking um, about, Portugal. about Portugal, mate, with him. Yeah, so um, we spent a week, well, we didn't spend all the week, we spent half the week um, touring the Algarve, because this is where the uh, river was, and we went up to what's called the Anantasia, uh, the area in the middle, mm. which is quite awesome. There is some huge lakes up there, huge yeah. lakes. Oh, yeah, yeah, huge lakes. Um, we... I didn't give a glowing report to the golfing company. Uh, there's loads of carp. Uh, one of those typical situations where, because the weather's so hot, they breed mm. massively. You know, probably like the the cheerer. You know, they breed you know, more than once a year. Uh, but unless you've got something to wipe out the fry, um, you, they just get overrun. You know, yeah. Cassine, for example, the reason you know again south of France, red hot. No doubt they breed you know, very energetically, but the snow water that goes in the winter kills off the fry. Yeah. Uh, with, um, sh- uh, sorry, with uh, canaries, um, it's because it got so hot, uh, uh, the water would deoxygenate and they regularly have big fish kills there. So the opposite reason, but that's how the uh, populations get controlled. But mm. areas a lot of Spain and France and Portugal, um, it's more difficult. Um I love Portugal. I've got, you know, I've got um, real passion for the place, and uh, that's mainly because you, know, I, you can go over there and carp fish now, and not see another angler because you yeah. know it's too damn hard to uh, find uh, big fish. In fact, it's only uh, probably five years ago that uh, I identified the first lakes with fifties in. You know, but it's great. It's great. You know, say so I know. Because they're not sixty. Well, it's, now everyone's looking for seventy eights or whatever, you know. So that you can have real quality adventure fishing, yeah. And you're never gonna, you know, see another angler. But yeah, some massive waters in there, and without doubt, they've got massive carp. And I heard Ronnie DeGroat told me this early nineties of a guy who had a, a hit of a couple of upper twenty kilo and a thirty five. Kilo fish, thirty-five kilo. Well, that was a time when you know you, you caught a twenty-five kilo. You know, so yeah. Me and uh, Gary actually um, did go up a mountain, looking down on this huge barrage. And uh, we, as we drove up, we had stopped because we saw these big areas of black shadows. Yeah, uh, but it was wee beds because oh, right. they weren't moving. When we come back down, the wee beds are gone. So oh, we man. actually had found you know, a group of really big carp. But, um, so were you but, actually fishing on this trip or was it just a case of just going over as many lakes as you can and getting a sort of a, an observational look at them? That was about just you know, looking around, yeah. looking around. But yeah, I've yeah, um, got some great memories of Portugal. Well, you know, I told a story and I, you know, I was uh, going for a little village of about eight, ten houses and um, saw a little bar, parched, stopped, walked in and George Best was in there. Jeez. You know, I don't know how many people know George Best. Is he well known now? Yeah, I mean, George Best, an absolute legend. Yeah. And I spent, uh, you know, the afternoon drinking with him. He was on orange juice then. He was off to the hours. Yeah. But a very quiet, unassuming guy. You know, um, yeah, so how random's that? How random's that? This is in the middle of nowhere. You know, there's a, a, you know the great story he told, which I think other people have been told, actually, you know, in, in his you know, peak of his career. Um He's going out with Miss World, and uh, they went to a casino, and he had a win. And they've uh, gone back to the hotel room, and you know she stripped out her ball gown, so she's just got stockings and suspenders, the kit on. You know, and you imagine what that looks like, on Miss World. You know? Yeah. And he's got all the money he's won, like fifty grand, just thrown it on the bed. So she's lounging amongst all this money, and uh, you know they've decided to order a bottle of champagne, and. Um, Knock on the door. Um, like a butler type's coming, you know, a guy like, you know, you know older than you know, ever, you know, always <laughs> and, you know, with a tray and yeah. champagne. He's walked in and out the corner of the eye, you know, he's seen Miss Weld in a kit, you know, so, you know, so she's not embarrassed, you know. So, yeah. You know, used to have been seen virtually naked, lounging on the bed amongst all these thousands of quids. And he's poured the uh, champagne out 
And then um, he said to George Best, he said, Mr. Best, he said, um, I wonder if you would consider it not impolite if I asked you a question. George said, no, go ahead. And he just said, Mr. Best looked at her again and said, where did it all go wrong? <laughs> he obviously thought she was a hooker. Yeah. <laughs> Expensive one, mate, but uh, that's all the money about. Uh, yeah. I used to see him at South in the station regularly when I was yeah, younger. He, um, he had a, a girlfriend in Thorpe Bay. Um, I think, again, she might have been a Miss England or something. And sad, he's seen me at the station late at night out of his head. You know, yeah. Just, just one of these addictive personalities. A great, he did great it, tragedy. He? Was, uh, Never got on to Best what? footballer ever, probably. You know. Yeah, mate. Brilliant mm. footballer. No doubt about that. Um, no, never got on to cart fishing with him? No? No, 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 no. No? No, no. no. And so we were talking, as I said, um, Gary Bays, you talked this Portugal trip, but there was obviously subsequent trips as well with regards to a little bit of stuff in Europe with him. Got like. Yeah, we were. Yeah, we've got where we've been. Me and Gary, um, we travelled a lot because of various, you know, shows mm. you know, throughout Europe. You know, we either fished all year in Germany, Austria, Belgium, Holland, yeah, France. Of course, um, there was a huge show every year in Belgium. Um, there was a shop called Janssen's, uh, massive shop for that time, and. Um, they were at the cutting edge, if you like, of you know getting uh, English carp tackle, because um, you know it wasn't readily available. You know, Nash Nash tackle wasn't available. I didn't export it. You know, no. um, people would come and found it. Anyway, this um, uh, Belgium, no, sorry, this Dutch guy uh, started uh, coming over and buying my gear and taking it over to Janssen's, and Janssen's used to have a, a show um, every. I think February, in a, a barn next to their shop, freezing cold, you know, and we used to have to go over there and stand freezing, you know, selling uh, gear um, every, for two days. And, you know, it was mad. Um, you get coach loads uh, come up from you know, uh, France. And when I say coach loads, I mean literally. You know, dozens of coaches just full of French anglers and, you know, there wasn't a lot of French that spoke English then, so they would have nominated someone who could speak English. And you know, you'd have a, a guy come up to you and say, "Oh, can I have a forty over wraps, please?" Wow. You, know, you, know, you know, they're buying that. You know, he's buying for the whole coach. You know, and you know, I remember um, seeing the owner arguing with a couple of French. And so uh, this Eric, and my, you know, this guy I'm telling you about, used to buy a gear. He could speak five languages. He went over and saw it all out, and he come back. He said, "Oh, the only thought they were trying to cheat him." He said, "Well, he laughed. He said they just bought four hundred quid's worth of catch and flavours." <laughs> yeah, and you'd walk out, and there'd be be people sitting on poles with boilies waiting for their mate. You know, you know it could be like three, four hundred kilos. You know, in essence, they was buying all their gear, you know, for yeah. the whole year. Yeah, and it was mental. It was mental. You know, and that was um. One of the ways, you know, Nash boat, sorry, Nash tackle, you know, got into France because then when we was going over to France, um, you regularly had French, you know, find you out, you know, and a lot of anglers were financing their trips by selling their gear at the end, you know, because yeah, yeah, yeah. the, the gear just wasn't available. I think I might have mentioned that earlier, but yeah, so, um, what about the fishing? Did you obviously you're on trips, but the fishing that you experienced sort of Holland, Belgium, around there. What were those experiences like? That was some mega experiences. You know, I remember, um, a real, got a real fond memory of one in Holland. We was over doing a show there, and uh, me and Gary were fishing at night, and this Dutchman uh, took us to this uh, park lake. Um, I always remember him saying, uh, one in ten is a twenty, and one in a hundred is a mirror. Anyway, he's a... Uh, uh, set up. It's quite shallow, probably no more than a metre meet and a half deep. And uh, we've been talking to him about rigs as well. He just didn't believe you know, in my theories. Rigs were really important, you know. And, uh, and he said, I'm not here. And the lake's not massively pressured like English lakes. So I'm at one end. I've got this guy, I don't know. 20, 30 yards down the bank from me. And Gary's the other side of him, so Gary's like probably 100 metres from me. And um, there's all these blokes walking around this park. And 
I'm beginning to think, really? You know, I just saw them chatting and they disappear in the bushes. I think the final point was uh, when um, this guy in a pink tracksuit with pink poodles came along. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But they're all going up to Gary, you know, Gary's having great chats with him and all that. And I thought, no, Gary, you know, you remember what I said, how naive he is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, in fact, um, when he come up that evening, he said, oh, he said, oh, they're really friendly around this park. I said, Gary, behave, they're all gay, mate. You know? <laughs> but anyway, um, <clears throat> yeah, I got a, a take and um, it rolled on, the, sorry, it crashed out of the water. Roll crashed out of the water because it's so shallow. <laughs> and uh, it was a mirror and it was over 20. Yeah. You know, I'm mad. And um, I think that first night, late afternoon night, um, I had six. Wow. Gary had two. And the guy in the middle had nothing. Uh, two or three of them were 20s. Yeah, you know, remember, you know, whatever. And then the next, you know, I think I had uh, three and Gary had five or something. The bloke in the middle had nothing. So this pattern, you know, is going on. You know, even me or Gary are catching these virtues. And I think it was on the fourth or fifth day. He said, "Oh, he said, now I listen to you about rigs," <laughs> and so he started, um, you know, applying my rig thoughts. And he actually was catching more than us. You know, he was in a better spot. Really? Yeah, you know, and it really did bring home, um, you know, the fact which I've always said, and I said to him, you know, it doesn't matter how little a water's being fished. The fact is those carp are under pressure and learning. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and this was a classic example. That part like it was hard, you know, hardly had any carp hanging the pressure, but they'd learn. You know, learn quickly as I, you know, experienced, you know, through my earlier times, you know, firstly it was about bait, but then it wasn't about bait. You know, you had to get everything else right, including the rigs and all that. You know, so that was interesting, you know, so a great week and go Gary made loads of friends. <laughs> Pink Poodle Man as well. Pink Poodle Man as well. Infamous yeah. part like yeah, you know, fish there, fish Belgium, uh, canals. Um, this is the time he met Ronnie De Groot and yeah, what an angler. Yeah, um, he he and um, three other mates. Uh, we took them on to fe- uh, to make a team, a Belgian team, and uh, they decided to hit the twenty canal. Uh, which you know, <laughs> a big fish in it, um, and one of them caught the fish. Yeah, and it was a new Belgian record. And he went to Janssen's that shop I told you about, and done a deal with Janssen uh, for a load of tackle to say it was caught on a certain other company's yeah. uh, bait. I went ballistic, absolutely ballistic. Is this with Janssen's? Yeah, he did the deal with Janssen's. Yeah, it was an English brand though. Yeah, yeah. Claimed it. I'm not going to say who. Yeah. Uh, claimed it was on his bay, but I went ballistic. You know, and I told Ronnie, uh, Luke, and uh, Phil Cottoner was the other one. Uh, probably one of the best uh, anglers uh, ever to come out in carp fishing. You know, they could, this is how Belgians acted. They could stick it. And it really, really focused them to fish as a team. The one thing about Belgians is they can fall out of each other in five minutes. Really? You know. Oh, yeah. yeah they, they like that. They like that. But this really focused them, and um, you know, out of that, of course, uh, Ronnie broke the yeah. Belgian record with the first 70, I think, which is the same fish. Yeah. Uh, then Phil caught it, you know, even bigger. You know, that was just a massive fish. You know, Were they know. both on squid, mate? That was a squid scopex, yeah. yeah. And then uh, Ronnie went and broke the common record as well. You know, so, yeah. so Nash bait now was you know, just touring, if you like. All over Europe and breaking, you know, yeah. you know, country records, county records. You know, I think it's probably fair to say there's never been a bait company, well, never been a bait or a bait company that can say they've broken so many uh, national or county records. You know, mm. as that we did at that time. You know, so. it was mega. It was mega. You talked a little bit there about your sort of advancements with regards to rigs. So we're talking sort of late eighties, early nineties. You've got into this sort of adventure carping, your rig sort of evolution at this stage, you talked about previously in in, um, in the Canaries using uh, the early versions of a liner liner, the hair rig slightly evolving with regards to it wasn't just tied onto the bend anymore. In terms of other things, for example, hook length materials, um, all that sort of development with regards to, yeah, potentially pop-ups, bottom baits, etc. Where are you at this stage with all that? Um, 
we're going through the bent hook rig. Okay. Um, and effectively stop using it. Yeah. Um, I better explain that because instead of having to say, well, all hooks are bent, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. You know, um, a bent hook is what we refer to as a long shank hook. In other words, a shank length is double the standard sh- shank length, okay? And then that is bent acutely. Um, we used to take dread and lure hooks and just below the point, uh, grip and repliers and then bend it. Mm. So, you know, you had that acute angle. So if you like, the eye would be at six o'clock and the bend would be at, say, ten o'clock. Yeah. Know, looking on the clock. Uh, it's a very effective hooker. You know, and you've had commercial hooks since. Uh, Nailers, for example. I think mm. it's one. I think Fox had a pattern or still do. Uh, and we found those incredibly dangerous uh, they work their way through, uh, so the hook comes out and then can go back in yeah. uh, to the extent where it can hook, go through the bottom lip, come out, and then catch in the top lip and pin both lips together. Um, I We actually brought a bent hook pattern out, and then I just scrapped the stock, you know, rolled it off and done the dough rather than you know, think, yeah. think that we could be killing carp. So after the bent hook, um, we just really, if you like, left with taking a step back uh, you know going backwards so still with our hair rigs uh, as I said it was really attached to the bend but we started noticing the take rate dropping and that's because you know they're just blowing against the bait sucking and it was easy for them to get rid of it but um, if you moved it round to the shank opposite the point then it create more of a pivot when it was caught up they couldn't suck it out as easy and that you know that helped and then as I mentioned um Care Bear and Frog had realised that the angle the, the way the knot come off the eye yeah. really did help the hook turn um and how they was keeping it at an angle was basically filing the eye to make a flat point they told me about that little secret which is quite relevant um a funny story, actually. There's a guy, I think his name was called Dave Benham. Um, he was writing a series in David Hall's called Fishing. Yeah, yeah. It might have been called Starting at the Beginning or something. You know, he was, you know, uh, carp fishing, trying to learn about carp fishing. Right. And he had it completely upside down. You know, I used to read his articles because it used to so frustrate me that you could get it so wrong. Yeah, and it really, yeah, really was getting to me. So I started writing to him because I wanted to help him out. You know, right. And, um, I sent him um, one of my rigs where I, I uh, fold the eye down flat. And he sent me it back. Right? And he explained that in the post the uh, knot had moved. And so he come up with a way of uh, keeping it there. And he'd stuck a bit of tube over the shank and then put a hole through the bottom mm. and passed it through. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I had this guy called Andy Carr who was working for me at the time, like my right hand man, and you know, what, you know, showed him, wow, you know, that's, that's what we used yeah. to answer you. This is where we are. That was our major egg, yeah. major edge. You know? And the funny thing is, I also know Jim Gibbons had contact with him. Because then Jim Gibson wrote about the liner liner. Mm. I've never asked Jim, but I bet you know, that Dave Benham told him as well. Yeah. And then when Jim wrote the article, I said, no. You know, I called Andy over. You know, I was gutted. Blown. You know, yeah, because it was blown, because you know, we'd had it for a year or two before. But yeah, and that, you know, that liner liner rig just, well, just become so yeah. famous and popular. So that's to answer your question where we are at at yeah. this point. Rods, reels, still die work at this point? Um, if I am, it's only just. Okay. Um, I'd had a couple of, I'd had an incident with uh, Darwa, which left a bad taste in my mouth. Um, I went over to do a show in Germany. The result of that show is one of the bears in my office. Oh, the, the office bear. And, um, <laughs> do this show in Germany. And I walked in. And I saw Kevin Nash pike rods 
than Kevin Nash telescopic car was. Yeah. You know, what the, you know? Yeah. You know, uh, I'd never designed them and never would have done them. I'd never put a name to a pike, but I weren't a pike angler. Uh, and uh, most importantly, I wasn't getting paid either. You know, so mm. I, I felt I felt disappointed and let down you know, by you know, such a famous brand, you know, world-leading brand could do a stroke like that. And then um, Dahl removed uh, all consultants' names from Rods. Um, I think the story, as I understood it, was that they'd had a fallout with some uh, famous angler had his names on their product in Japan. And it may have been there, so they've got loads of his uh, gear with his name on it, and they had to destroy it. Yeah. So they started a policy where you know, um, uh, they weren't promoting the anglers who they was paying. And I was just, really? Yeah. What are you going to pay me for then? You know, it just seems pointless. You know, me just coming along you know, to an event and getting paid money and uh, you know, not feeling it'd be worth. And that might sound crazy to some people, but I know I'm not the first who's felt, you know, um, not, you know, I'm not being used, you know, I'm yeah. just taking money. You know. And so, and yeah, so eventually, I, you know, it was around this time I said, no, I'm going to leave. And then after that, of course, it gave me the opportunity to uh, then bring out my own rods. First ones were in um, conjunction with Sentry. Mm. Uh, that was the first um, pursuits. You know, yeah, and well. then later on the ball come back on the scene. The guy worked in you know, Darwin, but yeah, really, we then made rods with a uh, sentry. Yeah, wow. And hook length materials. I think I can't remember where I left. We left you in part two. I think you were we still st- on dental floss and and, and it was that it was Dacron and Dacron, uh, yeah, Dacron yeah. dental floss. But um, yeah, I got to know a guy called David Hurst, who used to um, have a business. Um, what do you call it? You don't call it weaving, do you? Um, whatever you call it, weaving uh, fibres. What upholstery stuff? Or no, no. I think it was for the um, rag trade. Oh, okay. Um, he had machines that uh, would make well, basic hook link material. Yeah. Um, he must have been an angler. He was an angler actually, and it was through Rod. Um, when we catch him, he'd contact him Rod, and anyway, he supplied me with um, hook links. Yeah. Um, what do we call them? Trick link. Trick link. Trick link, I oh, think okay. it was one of the first we had. Uh, yeah, so we was the first, definitely the first uh, fishing tackle company, I think, to start sending them um, Brady Talk links. Mm, wow. uh, so that's the early 90s. Um, in fact, the first ones we had, I never forgot, I forget, he uh, supplied me a sport. And I took it fishing and um, I had four takes and lost a lot. Really? And I was frightened by the fifth take to pick up the rod because as soon as I was picking up the rod... They were gone. You know, there was no stretch in it. Yeah. It just, and it was just, you know, so brittle. It was just shearing, you know. But, yeah, um, that was the start of hook link. Wow. Just dedicated hook links for fishermen. For anglers, I guess, is the yeah. way to put that. Yeah. yeah. So, again, early 90s, we talked a little bit about this sort of, yeah, sort of thirst for adventure fishing. Mm. We've talked about you and Gary going to places in conjunction with Nash Tackle and Nash Bait anywhere sort of really poignant stand out over this time, early 90s? Any other ventures abroad to any famous venues or anything like that? Well, this is another real bit. This is Lac de Dare, Shantico. Shantico, wow. Yeah. Um, Joe Taylor, famous um, famous act, traveller again, yeah. um, owned a tackle shop called JK Tackle in Bicester. Yeah. I so say just you know, lifelong, massive, passionate angler. I was heavily into carp fishing then, uh, especially in France. Um, and I think the story, as I think I heard it, um, this is all through Nigel Bovaway, by the way. I, Nigel Bovaway has um, introduced himself to me, if you like, by then. Yeah, Nigel Bovaway is yeah. the one who does the... What's it, radio programme then, was it called? Angler's Blues, uh, Fisherman's yeah, yeah. Blues. Yeah. Um, he first contacted me, I think in the late 80s. We was uh, running uh, pike fishing, corporate days, if you like, pike fishing trips on the Norfolk Broads with um, Dave Plummer's good friend, Richard Furlong, who sadly has died. 
and Nigel went on one of these trips and you know, somehow that you know, got yeah. into me. Great network, Nigel. He, he then was at the time as an editor of um, a newspaper at Heathrow. Uh, so, um, yeah, he networked with me and we become quite good friends. Went fishing a few times. Um, he uh, become really friendly with Plumber and I don't know how, also uh, Joe Taylor. Anyway, Joe <coughs> was on his way back from some trip south of France, and they would overnight on the water you know, to break up the trip, and he um, saw this huge lump of water mm. near Paris called Lac de Dare Chantico. It's, uh, it was um, built to uh, provide the water for Paris Reservoir, mm. and he stopped... Uh, I'll never forget the story uh, Nigel told me um, Joe just sat on the bank looking at this monstrous inland sea and thinking you know, where do I start yeah. what he didn't know is it was basically an aquarium you know I always used to say if you had half a month as a carp angler you know um, if you got it wrong it'd take you three to four days and then they would find you yeah yeah you know, and in fact, me and Nigel never did more than a, a four-nighter there. But, yeah, so um, Joe's fishing it and having immense hits of fish. Um, very secretive. He's fishing it with another guy who's like, you know, he's fishing buddy. But yeah. Massive, very secretive. But that guy took, for some reason, took um, Kevin Maddox and it got blown Um I think it's front page of Angus Mail, mm. ton up a carp. They call it a ton of carp yeah. you know, yeah. in a week, you know, which is a mega thing to do, then catch a ton of carp in a week. You know, later, me and Nigel did it in three nights, by the way, or more. But, really? Oh, yeah. Oh, but, yeah. Um, but, yeah, that just blew it. So Joe fell out with his mate. Um, then kind of, I don't know how, but then um, he linked up with Dave Plummer. And they was going there and... Um, <clears throat> Nigel was telling me the stories and it just really captivated me. You know, the size of it, you know, and the, you know, the fish and mm. all and the conditions. But most importantly, um, the dodging, the guard of pesh. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, that really appealed to me. Yeah, yeah, you know, you know, well, the stories did anyway. Yeah, you know, I you bet. Know, what, what, sort of, what sort of extremes did they go to? Because they're quite stringent on there, the guard de pêche, notorious. Well, for example, uh, they're on to you know, Joe Taylor. You know, yeah. And you know, Joe, Joe become almost like the white herp you know, in France. You know, I think you got promoted if you caught him. Right. Okay. In fact, um, Joe had to give up um, uh, fishing in France in the end, carp fishing, because uh, I think if he was caught once more, he was going to be jailed. Really? Oh, yeah. You know, but um, that's pretty good going, mate, isn't it? I remember one story um, where Joe was fishing uh, you know, with the lads, and um, they sent the uh, army out on a night manoeuvre. Oh, okay. With the guard of pests to catch them. You know, they knew where they were fishing. Oh, to catch them? Mm. Oh, my God. And um, I think it was Dave Plummer who heard them coming and made a, a shout, a, shouted out. You know, threw his rods into uh, the lake yeah. and run, and um, but they got caught. Oh. Joe didn't, right? He hid in the forest, and what had happened? Uh, the the uh, the base for this manoeuvre had been a, a, a campsite uh, um, a mile away, <laughs> the other side of the forest, where the you know, the army and the uh, guard of petrol met up. When they raided, and so they marched Dave Plummer and them through the forest to the police car, because in the, even in those days they had um, computers in their cars. Really? So it was very easy for them to look into records, yeah, you know, yeah. or book, yeah, and then you blah blah. Yeah, they were well ahead of I think the English police, and so they were booking a uh, Plummer and Co in, and meanwhile Dave's uh, sorry Joe's crept through, and he's hiding in the bushes, you know. And so they're all booked in. Police car's driven off. Um, they, Joe's watched it go out the campsite, yeah. down this hill, up the next hill. So the lights go over the top of that hill, 
down the next hill. So it go over the, the next, up to the top of the next hill and over that. You know, so it's like yeah. three, four miles away. I'm safe. I'm safe. So he's walked out and he's chatting with Dave. Then a hand's gone on his shoulder. Good oh, evening, oh, Mr. Oh, oh. Taylor. They dropped a copper off to go back and nick him. They knew he was around somewhere. Mate. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you yeah, know, and it, all that really kind of, you know, appealed to me. So, um, <laughs> right. You know, so I arranged to go with Nigel, you know, and I'm on it. You know, this is a bit like uh, the Canaries. Yeah. You know, but different set of problems, you know, which is all carp fishing. It's, you know, so instead of uh, you know, luggage and weight and all that, it was about concealment. Yeah. You know, so, um, we took a camo net and we took bow saws, you know, something cut down trees to hide the motors and everything, you know. Yeah, so we was, you know, uh, we'd up for, we decided to um, take a real proper size dinghy, an inflatable dinghy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the basic rule we had when we fished Lactadere, we'd drive round, maybe not all. It's 52 miles round, by the way. Yeah, yeah, it's a big yeah, yeah. Oh, it's huge. You know, yeah. that was one of the things that appealed to me as well, that, you know, I never fished like today and could see another angler thinking about it. There you go. Really? There you go. Yeah, yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Paradise, yeah. mate. And um, How much was known about stock in terms of size of fish? Um, this is before Kevin's obviously wrote about... No, 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 no. This, no. This is after. Oh, is this after? Mm. This is after. Oh, say right. Joe's gone, falling out with uh, uh, the guy, and now he's uh, say fishing with Dave and that. Um, well, we just knew it's just you know, stuffed full of dirty, great. When I say dirty, great carp, yeah, you know, he was catching thirties, you know, one after the other, yeah, you know, with a chance of forty plus. Well, that was quite rare, but you know, just so you know, remember, you know, a thirty now is equivalent of like forty five, fifty now. Yeah. You know, but um, then I mean, but uh, yeah, but it's just the volumes, mate. Um, yeah. But um, so we went, and the, in actual fact, we agreed uh, to meet up with Ronnie to grow it. Uh, oh yeah. So um, we drove round. We found where various groups of anglers were, because there was a couple of places where you could legally night fish, but yeah, that was like pressured fishing you know, amongst yeah. all the rabble, and anglers weren't. Dare I say, behaving properly. Yeah, yeah, you know, you know, it's a bit, a bit rich after me at Harefield, but you know, <laughs> they was going down there for sessions, you know, getting tanked up and all that, being noisy. Yeah. And so that attracted the guard of Pesh. So, in essence, our rule was find where the anglers are, were, and go the opposite direction. Mm. Yeah, and then uh, try and follow various things we learned, wind or whatever. And that's why we took a, a decent boat. So we could just get in it with all the kit and go. We originally took a really large uh, inflatable. Mm-hmm. So so off we went. Um, parked up at the we parked up at um, these toilet blocks, toilet blocks all around it, showers and that. Got in the boat and went off into the wilderness. Um, Nigel had an idea where he wanted to go because Dave Plummer had then started doing trips down there. He okay. was doing like I think four days on, three days off. Yeah, he's, he's now become a, 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 a an angling guide. Yeah, guide. Yeah, along yeah. with Richard Furlong. In fact, I saw him um, after one trip. Um, it was that trip actually. I was thinking about it. we took a swim off him. Yeah, did you? Mm. I'll tell you why in a minute. So we found this spot, and they were just packing up. And there's um, uh, we watched them. We we saw them uh, lose. Uh, a carp, and um, they explained that they was fishing next to these cut, cut off trees, you know, submerged trees. Yeah, and they lost like nearly eighty, ninety percent of what they caught. Anyway, so we're fishing. Uh, we ain't caught anything. Yeah. Uh, start the next day. This was the evening. We couldn't fish at night. Ronnie said we absolutely can't fish at night. Get caught. So the next morning we start fish all day. <coughs> Catch nothing. In the evening, fish start rolling over the markers. We ran the rods in, Ronnie insisted. And so next day, go for that again. Evening's coming. Carp start rolling. 
We've only six, six, two dames of fish, and we wind the rods had you, in. Had you seen the guard the pesh at right coming they kept, or not? They kept coming across. Oh, okay. You know, it's kind of, I didn't know the geography of the lake. Um, yeah. But to my right was a number of islands where um, Ronnie and Nigel were fishing. I fished to the left. I was on like a kind of corner. I, I knew the water went round to my left, but I didn't know where it went. And we, I'd see the, the guard of uh, Pesh Zodiac come round. Yeah, it's, it's three miles across here. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it was coming up the middle. I'll tell you how, it's, how I knew it's three miles across because uh, a day later, just me and Nigel, and uh, I, I used to get in the habit of going out in the dinghy and baiting. Yeah. Nigel is an amazing um, athlete, and he would swim out with me, right? But before we'd gone out, I think the evening before, he was musing. He said, how far do you, you reckon he's across there? I said, I don't know, Nigel, it's very difficult to measure distances. Yeah. mile and a half. He said, I reckon it's double that. I went, really? I said, no way. No way is that three miles across there. <laughs> anyway, I'm out baiting up, and I look around, there's no Nigel. Yeah. So I've gone in and uh, I thought he was back at you know, base camp, but he weren't. There's no sign of him. You know, and uh, I'm looking, you know, because there's quite a bit of weed around. Not yeah. massive, but there's weed around as well. You know, and you just don't swim in weed, do you? No. And anyway, it's a couple of hours. And a couple I'm, of hours? Oh, I'm really stressing now. Yeah, I bet. You know, he's drowned, isn't he? You know? Yeah. And I'm just thinking of uh, going back to you know, toilet blocks and seeing if I get hold of. Ten dimes and a guard of pesh, and I saw something out in the distance, and it's getting near, near. It's Nigel's head. I could have killed him. He's come out of the water and said, "I was right. It was three miles across." Yeah, you know, he'd swam you know, there You're and back. Joking? Nah, nah. That is impressive, mate. Yeah, he's so he's um. I think I always say that we have along with Adam, Nigel is the best person I ever fish with. Really? Oh yeah, because you know um, he's so hard. You know, he's naturally an hard person, you know, so he can deal with so much pain and discomfort, you know, maybe more of that later. And he never, ever is negative or down, at least I've never seen it, you know. But, yeah, he's just, he's just a ridiculous bloke. Yeah, um, sounds it. Not so many years ago, you know, he's he's massive in his cycling. Not so many years ago, um, he, um, he broke his pelvis cycling. Right? Yeah. You, know, you know, he's come over to see me, crutches and whatever. What have you done this time, Nod? You know, there's not many things he hasn't broken or whatever. He used to be a rugby, used to be a rugby player. Yeah. You know, you know I, I nagged him to give up, you know, because he's always getting injured. You know, he finally relented after he had his ear bitten off. You know, he's, <laughs> he's, 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 a, he's mad. Anyway, so, yeah, yeah. He's, he's broken his pelvis anyway. So he's got over that and um, he's gone to the hospital to uh, have his you know, final, if you like, check. And, you know, the surgeon who did the operation on his pelvis, you know, checked him out. Yeah, you're fine now, fit. He's got on his bike, riding home. Is it another bike up the arse, oh. come off and broke his shoulder? <laughs> and it's the same surgeon who's just seen who... who, 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 who oh, but that's no. typical Nigel, typical Nigel. That is not the one. But as I say, as a fishing buddy to rely on. You know, so, he's, yeah, so... um. Yeah, where was I? So, anyway, when he goes home, oh. right, we're going to get the rods out. Fuck yeah. it. I said to him, fuck this night. I ain't come all this way not to night fish, not to catch them. You know, so, we put the rods out that night. And um, we're on the break off leads, right? You know, after seeing what happened with plumbers, you know, guy, and learning they'd lost so many yeah. sunken tree stumps. I showed Nigel, uh, you know, the hair field rig, you know, with, yeah. with the, 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 the thin mono, so the lead would break off the line. Explained to him, look, you know, hopefully if we hook them, they'll come over the tree stumps, you know, lift up in the water about the weight of the lead on, as I found out, hair field, we've got a chance of landing them. So we put out six rods, you know, on the break off leads, and we sit in there, and... Um, we heard, it's a noise that once you got to know it, uh, yeah. the hairs would come up on the back of your neck. It was uh, the Garda Pesh Zodiac with twin Mercury's on the back. 
Yeah, serious bit oh, of What the fuck? You know, this is pitch dark, you know. They come up, come round from my left. They went up the middle of the lake, turned round and went back. You know, what are they playing at? You know, we hadn't seen them do it any other night, you know. <laughs> anyway, we're sitting there and Nigel's had a take. Oh. And I've gone with him. He's playing it. And we've heard, no, no. It's come out again from the left. It's come round about a mile and a half front in front of us, dead in front. And then suddenly there's lights in our face. He's oh. turning and coming towards us. Shit. Yeah. Um, there's very deep reed beds and we're in this reed bed. So... In essence, we've ended up with basically just our noses out of the water and a bit of our faces. Uh, with the carp still on somewhere out in the lake, him holding the rod underwater. The gendarme boat's probably as near as you are to me. And they've got this huge torch spotlight shining in the reeds trying to find us. Then I hear, I get a take. He just went, oh, oh, God. He went, blew up, and stopped. Right? And then every, whatever, 30 seconds, minute, two minutes, I just had a single bleep. So what's happened, I'm thinking, it's hit the lead, broke the line, yeah, the, to the yeah, lead, yeah, yeah. and the odd bleep I'm hearing is it probably wormed its way into the snacks. Yeah. Okay. And I'm thinking they're going to hear that, because I'm, I'm probably, I don't know, 50 metres away from Nigel. But I think with the engines and the Mercury's, they never heard it. Did they not? Anyway... After what seemed like a lifetime, they gave up and they go off. <laughs> Nigel lifts the rod and to our astonishment, he's still got the fish. Oh, mate. Right. So he lands that, okay. What fish was that? It was 30. It was, yeah, it was classic like the dare carve. You know, oh. they, didn't, they didn't weigh you know, much under 30. Yeah. Um, I've gone down, so we've netted that, sorted that out. I've gone down to my rod expecting to wind it out of the stag. Yeah. And it's on. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> and that was, a, that was a much bigger fish than Nigel's. I can't remember. Maybe Nigel's was a 20 and mine was a 30. Yeah. Because he still reminisces about the pitch he took of me in the wild mint with it. And, oh, my God, so, you know, we've landed that and we are absolutely buzzing. I bet, yeah. Yeah, you know, like, you know, we've not only caught the car, but we beat the gendarmes. I was going to say, you, you know. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, it, it, was, it was mega. It was mega. You know, uh, the adrenaline rush was unbelievable. Yeah, I bet. You know, unbelievable. I've rarely had one since. And um, the end of that story, by the way, is um, it kept bothering me. Yeah. How and why they come out. You know, because uh, we had another example after that where, again, they come out. And I sussed, it, it was the bite alarms. Oh, right. right? So we had to uh, fish with them really low. Yeah. Right? And so we worked out they must have um, hearing uh, uh, like a detection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it was definitely the bite alarms they was hearing. Anyway, so we've packed up. Um, we've gone back to um, the car, the car park next to the toilets. Yeah, you know, and it's still in my head. You know, what is this? What is this equipment they got that can pick up? You know, buy alarms so far away. Yeah. You know, so every uh, toilet block had a, uh, a map of Lac de Dare. You know, so I've gone over and I've just laughed. You know, I said, Nigel, come here. What? I'm on this point, as I said, this corner. Yeah. Right. You went. So I'm on the corner. You went down it, and then it formed a bay. Right behind me, the gendarmes uh, in that base place, yeah, yeah. base was twenty yards behind <laughs> me. <laughs> You're fishing in the back garden. I'm fishing in their back garden, nearly. Yeah, you know, no wonder. But you've yeah. done well to get away with that. We've done well to get away with that. But um, another thing I remember about that trip was there was um, I don't know what form of tree it was, because it was really lovely hot weather. It was in June, mm. and uh, really lovely hot weather, and we used to sit there chilling. And there was a tree we used to sit under, and it used to weep moisture. Right. And it was like being under a fine mist shower. Yeah, so it kept you really cool. And meanwhile, there was um, a kite's nest behind us. Wow. And, you know, the, 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 the adults would come off, and as soon as they flew into the lake, the herons were on them. And we was watching these awesome you know, battles of 
like six herons mobbing a kite. Yeah. Know? Yeah, and this utter wilderness where you couldn't, you know, you couldn't see, you never saw another person other than the gender, the girl, the pesh, I mean, or a French angler poodle across, you know. It was just the wilderness experience, mm. you, know, um, you know, just amazing. And that, and that trip hooked me. Yeah. Um, so um, we agreed to go as soon as we could. I don't know how much longer it was, maybe a month later. Um, the, I am having to you know, put some effort into uh, work now. It's probably because, as I say, the company is really struggling. This is the time when I said to you, yeah. you know, we're in trouble. So, uh, you know, I couldn't go for weeks or whatever. So we was actually doing just long weekends. Ridiculous. Really? Yeah, we was leaving uh, on a Friday evening, um, getting to uh, Dover. This was ferries then before the tunnel. Um, we get there about 11, uh, get the ferry across and then drive down, what was it, I remember, the other side, it's about four hours, I think. Right. Uh, and then arrive at dawn. Um, yeah, and then, uh, so we'd fish uh, Saturday, Sunday, and then pack up um, wow. Monday, you know, and get the ferry back early afternoon. Um I think we did a few three nights. We did only one f- four nighter. I remember that. Uh, come back to that maybe, but yeah. So next time we went, um, I think that's when we took his mate Steve, uh, and I took my missus. Um, the level was dropping all the time. Yeah, and um, we decided to fish this mud bank, you know, right out in the lake. Um, don't know why. Again, I think maybe uh, Nigel got tip off and plumber. You know, the fish had moved up to the other end, and that was a hell of a way out. Um, I never get now. Uh, Nigel's got an Orkney, right? An Orkney um, rowing boat. So that's a basically an ocean going rowing boat. Yeah, uh, made of fiberglass. The reason we got that. Sorry, this is probably two, three trips late. The reason we got that is because if a wing got up on um, Lac de Dare, yeah. it was really such a struggle to. Um, um, get the boats out. Row, row, row the, the, the boats, you know, because there wasn't petrol engines weren't allowed unless you was guard a pesh. Yeah. You know, so little electric motors. So he got that boat, um, which is much more seaworthy, you know, because, you know, anglers were dying there. Yeah. You know, you know, they was going across that place loaded up with uh, gear in little Mickey Mouse yeah. dinghies, you know, and, you know, they was, they was dying. You know, yeah. it, was, it was a hairy place, you know. Yeah. The scariest thing was walking down the roads. The roads? Mm. Remember, this is um, a French valley yeah. uh, that they've decided to make into a reservoir. So yeah. so the standard thing is, you know, you, they, the crews would go in, cut down all the trees, and that's why the trees are always that high, because yeah. they've just chainsawed them, you know, waist high, um, demolish any buildings, uh, and take out all the, and the scrap metal people would go in and take all the scrap metal. Mm. Yeah, and I... Um, I heard uh, a story of so so as the levels dropped, you know, there's concrete roads yeah. which you could walk down you know, yeah. rather than walk on the mud because the mud was ridiculous. Yeah, you know? and I heard a story of a guy just walking along the road and he, he just disappeared in his in front of his mates. Jeez, you know, and uh, he's gone down a manhole. Oh, yeah, you know, which is now full of mud. You know, it took him days to find him. You know, so so or I, I once said we ought to walk down the roads with scaffold poles. You know. You know, Jeez, that is you know, mad, isn't it? Oh, yeah, it was a mad place, a mad place. And so, you know, and these trees were, they were a big problem. So these tree stumps that, you know, were sticking out. Yeah. I'll tell you a story about that in a minute. So anyway, um, so, yeah, we we got in the boat. Um, Nigel can't get, we elected not to get us all in for one trip, I think. Anyway, to give you an idea, of, this is what I'm saying about the scale, the scale of the lack of dare. Nigel uh, had um, extra long oars made. You know, he used to do a lot of rowing on the Thames. Yeah. So he could row. So he had oars made, I think, like a foot, 18 inches longer because he had the strength and leverage. And that, uh, those oars, plus uh, electric outboard, um, it took him an hour and a half to get us to the mud bank. Jeez. So an hour and a half back to pick up Stevie's mate, and then an hour and a half back, four and a half hours, you know, before we got He must fish. have been shattered. It's tough to like to say before he got fishing. And so, uh, yeah, so <clears throat> I don't think I remember that, that trip. 
He's he's from the site. Him and Steve are going out in the boat, uh, baiting an area. Yeah. And uh, they put um, he so he's throwing his uh um anchor over the side while they're baiting. His anchor was um a bucket full of concrete, probably cost him fifty pence. Yeah. And you know, me and me missus are uh, uh, watching them, and I'm thinking, what the fuck? We saw Steve grab hold of the anchor rope. Yeah. He's put his feet hard on one side of the boat and his back against the other. So he's got the anchor rope tight. And Nigel's jumped over the side and disappeared. Right. And, you know, what? just kept seeing his head occasionally bob up. Right. And then they've come back, but they've left a, a marker out, yeah. there, out there, which we never did, really. Yeah. You know, what the hell? The bucket's got jammed in the tree stump. Oh. And Nigel, this is when I learned one thing, Nigel is tight or was tight then, <laughs> right? And so he's got Steve to hold a rope tight. He's been shimmying up and down it like a Trying monkey in five metres of water to try and get the anchor out. That's mad. He never did, by the way. But, yeah, he's mad. Anyway, um, the other thing I remember about that trip is um, I'm asleep. Yeah. And I've woken up and... It's in the middle of a rainstorm. Right. And I'm absolutely drenched. You've got to keep goldfish in the uh, sleeping bag. You know, oh. The long journey and the massive, you know, you know, this is real, real tough stuff. You know, you, you know, you, yeah. you're having the long journey, you know, you, and then you've got, you know, all that effort to get to your swim yeah. you know, and get set up and all that. You and know. then battle the elements. You know, and, you know, so you're really exhausted by the time you get to bed. And this storm had come in, and I just slept through it. My umbrella was blown away. And so I'm just laying in this storm. You know, and I don't know how long it had, but I, I reckon there's two inches of water in my sleeping oh, bag. Man, it's horrible. Oh, it's absolutely freezing. And so um, the rest of that night, I was just walking up and down the mud bank just to try and keep warm. Mm. And I'll never forget it. As dawn come up, yeah, the lightning... It's crashing into the way. I've never seen that before in my life. There's also lightning running parallel to you know, the water, like a metre above. You know, you know, don't forget, you know, I've got three car- lumps of carbon in front of me and these fault lightnings coming across the surface just towards the... Joking. Oh, you know, it, was, it was awesome. It's awesome. But the, the reason I'm telling this story is I swear you know, on my life... I could not look out without seeing a carp in the air. Wow. Yeah. You know, I don't know how many thousands of carp there was in front of us, but... Yeah. What, all sizes, just absolutely everywhere? You couldn't look out without seeing a carp <laughs> in midair. That's mad. You know, you know the, the, I don't, the shoals were thousands then. Yeah. You know, you know it was like an aquarium. I, you know, on one trip, um, I had this misplaced idea that we'd hold them. So, and Nigel's got, a, Nigel's got a photo somewhere. I took a quarter tonne of boilies. Wow. This is for a weekend session. Yeah, a two or three night of only. And they just set us out. Yeah. You know, you know, I always likened it to, you know, the wildebeest. You know, they're, they're constantly uh, roving around that lake, you know, like wildebeest on, you know, on the plains. You know, they yeah. just, just come through and just eat it out and move on. You know, um, what... As that storm, you know, as say, was coming across us and all the carp arrived, um, we didn't get one take. All the rods simultaneously went off. Were you playing them in that line then? Huh? Were you oh, yeah. Playing oh, yeah. oh yeah. my God, mate. Yeah, um, I don't know how dangerous it was. Uh, there's no trees on this mud bank, so um, I certainly wouldn't have been sitting under a tree. But oh. I'll never forget the long to do. To this day, I've never seen lightning crashing into a lake. No. And I've certainly never seen fault lightning parallel to the water. You must, I wouldn't want to be playing a fish with a big old light. Did you go out on the boat and play them, or were you playing them all from the bank? No, no, we got them all from the bank. We, on that Oof. trip, on that trip, we never, never needed to go out on the boat at all. Um, and in terms them. of your development within that fishing, because obviously you fished a few sort of big waters you talked about, but in terms of, of the dare and the, the prospect of it, did you approach it baiting wise, as you said, with with mainly boily? But in terms of fishing at Distance, you've talked about the breakaway leads. Were you fishing 
rowing baits out far or were you fishing shore or how did that all sort of morph in in terms of evolving on there because well, it is a prospect and a half well as you say yeah it was all um more the learning curve wasn't it you know hair feels a learning curve you know and uh you know this this is another you know, massive learning curve and strings to our bows you know it's the first time um i got into boat work yeah. and i still massively love it to this day it's, a, it's another dimension to your carp fishing uh you know using boats and i i love rowing anyway you know in fact yeah. uh when me and alan have been abroad um if there's any boat work to do you know i just love rowing you know, now the kids all use electric motors don't they <laughs> uh, I, I just love rowing um so learning the the boat work and skills uh, was one thing. Uh, as you say, the break off leads. What I never told you, by the way, that night uh, when the guard of pesh hit us and I got that take and then I'm hearing it go bleep. Yeah. Bleep. Uh, sussed after that from subsequent takes that the random bleeps were the fish still feeding. <laughs> so they'd hit the lead, break yeah. the lead off. What the fuck? Oh, I'm all right. You know, carry on carry on feeding yeah and so yeah that was another edge that that discharge lead method uh yeah. gave us and, you know if they did bolt without the lead on uh they'd hopefully move above the snags but mm. those french fish as i say just such greedy pigs they just carry on they just carry on and you know that has to be noted you know um yeah. i think they're almost like they're almost like a different strain of carp. Yeah, you know, mm. a lot of those French carp in those big waters. They just, they just eating machines. Yeah, yeah. You know, they just the amount that their capacity to eat and how much they can eat is enormous compared to English carp. Do you think that's a product of their environment? Do you think that's a product of like the temperature and the sort of the sort of fertility of where they are? Or do you think that's just if you took that strain and put it in a relatively fertile lake in the UK, it would be the same? I think it's a bit of everything. Certainly, yeah. um, I th- they're probably short-lived. If you, um, if you, th- you know, I'm just thinking to answer your question. Sorry, I'm just thinking to answer your question. Uh, they grow so quick, so I imagine they're quite short-lived. Yeah, you know, they're putting on huge amounts of weight a year. Uh, so yeah, so they eat a lot to do that. Um, and it, food. Food source is a really interesting one. It's, you know, it's a lot of my thoughts on that are you know, based on when I developed the fishery here. But um, size of the food items and the richness yeah. uh, of those waters abroad is often significantly more than England, mm. you know, i.e., English fish are eating little bloodworm, whereas yep. over there they're eating you know, fresh lobster, i.e. crayfish, yep. or huge swan mussels. So if you're eating that size of food in volumes, I guess you're going to be able to eat more, aren't you? You're going to extend your stomach, if you like. Yep. You know, um, yeah. yeah, I'm a great believer in people shouldn't be necessarily overweight. You know, it's not... I don't think it's so much about what they eat is about how much they eat. Yeah. You know, whereas, you know, you control your weight by saying, right, no more. I could eat more, but I won't. You know, so you 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 manage your stomach, you know, your size of your stomach. Yeah. You know, um, and that's how I think you really keep you know, a, a reasonable weight rather than become a beast. Whereas, you know, you get an animal like a carp, you know, just stick, stick food in front of it, you know, and it, it just keep, keep on eat. eating it, yeah. you know. Um, yeah, and somewhere like Lac de Dare, which had thousands of fish in it, the the biomass, as they call it, that means yeah. the, the poundage or kilos of fish per acre, which is still very small, yeah. you know, because like I said, it's 50-odd miles round, and, you know, and the carp optimise it by just swimming great distances in huge shoals, yeah. you know. Uh, yeah. But, yeah, um, what did we... The boat work was really great to learn that. Um, sussing them. Yeah. The location was you know, massive. Uh yeah. massive. Um, like I said, the longest we went I think was four nights, a four night trip, so five day, four night, including, you know, travelling. Yeah. Um rule one was find where the anglers are, go in the opposite direction. And then uh we'd follow the wind. Um but I quickly learned that unless it was um 
went into autumn, I think they was mainly feeding on crayfish. And then there's a point in the autumn where they hit the blood one. Talk right. about that in a minute. Um, but they was mainly eating crayfish. And I established that the best depth on there for the crayfish was 15 foot. Right. And when we used to echo over trees, we see the carp in the trees, stumps, over the tree stumps. Yeah. So I worked out that they was over the wood in the day. Yeah. The wood gives off warmth, doesn't it? Yeah. All that. Or cover, whatever. But they was living in the, uh, over the tree stumps in the day. And then they was out hunting the cray at night. You know, hence the reason you never caught in the daylight. Yeah, all yeah. night. It was all night work for the, yeah. when they was hunting the crays. So we'd find an area, fancied, I no anglers around, especially the Dutch or the English, which was always pissed up. <laughs> that, that attracted the guard of pesh. Yeah, nightmare, red flags everywhere. Um, try and find somewhere we cover. Uh, we weren't, you know, we weren't daft enough to think that the guard of pesh probably didn't know he was around. Mm. And I actually think that they knew he was night fishing. Um, but in the end, they respected it. They respected us for respecting them. Yeah. Um, what we did, uh, what I used to do at the beginning was, I used to take two sets of rods. Yeah. yeah. I just think, it used to fascinate me how stupid anglers can be. Oh, we just hide up. Yeah. yeah. And we put our rods down the bank in the reeds. Really, guys? Yeah. <laughs> You're bivvied up here. Where's your fucking rods? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. But so I took a spare set of rods. So at night, I'd have my rods leaning against the bivvy. Yeah, yeah. And we'd have the rods hidden in the reeds. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we was getting away with it, but they visited us. I know on at least one occasion we was visited. I don't know whether it's guard or they would put the military out, but they definitely tried to catch us. Yeah. Uh, say because I know they visited us. When I had the rods propped up, but but then I began to get the impression that. They either couldn't catch us or, or they then respected us for not taking the piss. And yeah. I really th- I really think it was that second one. And there was a story, I'll tell you why. We went on a mud bank uh, one trip, just me and my missus. And her uh, name was Le Rossignol, French name. Okay. Right? Surname. And we were on this mud bank and it was a hell of a uh, trip to get out there. And it was also late afternoon. Mm. And I heard, oh, fuck. Yeah, yeah we are totally exposed. There was no cover on it. And the guy the pest turned up. And, and I always had this thing, try and be as friendly as possible. I quickly uh, cracked two bottles of beer, walked down, <laughs> bonjour, comment ça va? Want a beer? No. They're very stern. Yeah. Fuck. You know, so what's going to happen here? We're going to get shut down and we're yeah. going to have to leave the mud bank because they ain't going to leave us on there. You know, no. So with rods. You know, so... Busted, you know, we've wrecked our opportunity. After all that effort. Anyway, um, he said passports. He went, oh, Mr. Nash, you know, like this. Then, oh, you was in not? Oh, you French? I went, oui, yes. Uh, speak French? No. Sorry? Doesn't speak French. In, 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 a, in a word, they couldn't understand uh, yeah. that a French lady, yeah. by son, couldn't speak French. <laughs> They just found it massively hilarious. <laughs> and they just said, Mr. Nash, tab me on the bank. Bye. Good luck. Yeah. And, and they just, I fucking couldn't believe it. Fair play. That's a result. I couldn't believe it? it. And so I really do think they knew we was night fishing, but yeah. because we respected them. Yeah. Yeah. And didn't take the piss. And I say, we never would have a bivy up in the day. Yeah. 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 You know, we'd always, you know, just sit on you know, chairs or beds. You know, I think they uh, left us alone. Yeah. Because you know, exactly. we never got nicked. We never got nicked. That is a result, man. Yeah, but um, let's say we didn't take the piss. So, yeah, um, where was that story going? Where are we up to now? Just discoveries on that. What, what sort of bait were you using? Were you boilies uh, and a lot of them? Yeah, well, I told you, didn't I? One session we took a quarter of a ton. Um, I I attended a slideshow. Yeah. I think it was a, another uh, big Belgian shop that used to do you know, a weekend show that's called... Um, Rudy DeZuta, Water, Water Sports Central. Oh, yeah, I, I think it was him. I don't yeah. think it was Jansen. No, Jansen didn't do slideshows. Yeah, it must have been uh, Rudy DeZuta. And uh, Stevie, Stevie Briggs did a mm. slideshow. And it was on a French water that I knew. And when he finished it, you know, it struck me that 
he hadn't mentioned any issues he's got with crayfish and that place was alive with crayfish yeah and you know so i said to him steve do you have any crayfish issues and he said no nah. really he said no i didn't come to think of it i didn't have any, any at all as so we worked out it's because he's on scopex yeah not scopex squid yeah crayfish don't actually like scopex much mm. It's not their favourite, you know, and say Scopics didn't have any fish meals or anything in it. So to answer you, um, I'm all about food source. Yeah. Yeah, if you can find out uh, the food source of carp, then you'll have a chance of finding where that food source is located. Yeah. Uh, classic example, um, when the lakes uh, freeze, uh, defrosting, the ice in the next month, yeah. Angers to start going out. Yeah. We have the first sunshine of the year. Though all those anglers are going to be fishing in the deep water instead of looking in the shallows, mm-hmm. where the you know be the first place the sunlight heats up, and so that's where the carp, the first food will kick off. So that's where the carp will be. Yeah, that's kind of my whole uh, yeah, mindset to carp fishing. Yeah, uh, identify the food sources, then understand where the food sources will be at certain times of year. Okay. So the food source on Lactodare pre-autumn was crayfish, yeah, okay, crazy. as far as I'm concerned. So we knew they fed at 15 foot, so we want loads of crayfish. So I come up with the idea of taking um, um, bags of uh, trout pellet over yeah. to attract the cray. Bring him in on mass. Yeah, so we brought the crayfish in on mass with the trout pellet, and then we fished scopex bodies over the top. Yeah. And that was the, that was a winning method that absolutely smashed it. Absolutely smashed it. Mad. Yeah, you know, and the, the number of times, you know, we'd have multi takes at night. And then um if we couldn't find them, the other it was very um active at night, like I said, you hear them crashing. Yeah. And so if if we hadn't found them the first night, we I'd drift we get in the boat and just drift across, you know, on the breeze, listening yeah. out for them. Yeah, because where you heard them at night is, would be where they would be. Yeah, you know, the next night, you know, unless they've been pushed off. You know, that's an edge, isn't it? Mm, so, what were some of your memorable or any standout captures or hits on there? Have you got any? You, you've done well up on a two, lot of sessions here, mate. Two uh, really standout memories are: um, there's an island in the middle of Lactodare. Right, hell of a way out. Again, that must be must have taken some memory an hour and a half. Yeah. Or whatever to get out to it. Yeah, we decided um, to go out there because it had foliage on it uh, to conceal us. Our, we could uh, conceal ourselves in the day. We were very nervous of the garden. You know, yeah, you know, you're out in the middle of like we we we'd done the mud bank. Yeah, uh, this is this is pre me uh, the garden coming to me. Yeah, with, with uh, Suley Ross in also, but we'd done that the night in the mud bank when I was in the storm, and we was very wary. You know, uh, getting caught out there. Mm. So um, I think it was a nut- next session. We decided to go out to the main island in the middle of um, Lac de Dare. Oh. And uh, we set up and joined the afternoon. And um, nothing had happened. It was it, That was a, a trip to toll the mud. Yeah. You know, the, the levels are dropping rapidly now. Um, I think it was dropping like two, three, four every week. Wow. And you know, it's really... Uh, it's a big sheet of water to drop that much, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, real, really deep. The mud would come up to nearly your knee. In fact, um, we used to go barefoot because if you wore wellies or waders, you yeah. couldn't wear wellies, it would have gone. But if you wore waders, you know, they look like 10 tonne of mud on them. So yeah. we decided it's best to go barefoot in it. Um, even though I'm digressing a bit, but even that was a, a real toll, you know, so all this mud um, I, there's a famous picture somewhere where I had two buckets outside my bivvy because the mud was like grease Yeah. You know, so you didn't want to you know, get it in your sleeping bag or whatever so I used to have two buckets full of water so I put one leg in one bucket <laughs> get the worst off then put it in the other bucket and you know, get hopefully <laughs> you know, the residue in the same with the other yeah. but you still come home with your sleeping bag you know, you know, just a slimy mess yeah. you know. but it also used to stick to the inset, you know, the underside of, you know, your foot. Yeah. Um, and it was kind of interesting on this particular trip I'm going to tell you about. By the end of it, um, I just gave up. I couldn't hit a take. I was in so much pain I could hardly walk. I ended up trying to 
hobbled to the Rodri bivvy sticks. But Ooh. it's the only time I've ever given up on catching carp and said to Nigel, mate, you'll have to um, really? take her. The pain was intense across the top of my foot. Um, yeah, if something happens when you flatten off the bottom of your foot, it puts all the pressure. It's just mind blowing pain. It's, like, it's the only time I've ever given up. And I had to let uh, Nigel have the last takes. And what really gutted me was he wasn't suffering from it. You know, I could have punched his lights out. How's he done that? How's he got away with that? Well, the funny thing was, he had his lady action. It happened to him on the ferry on the way home. He was in massive pain and had to hobble off the ferry. So, why had that delayed reaction? But Result for him, though, he got a few more takes. Mm, well. <laughs> Cut me, yeah. So, the only downside we're walking barefoot is you didn't know what you uh yeah. walked on. One, uh, on that storm trip, yeah, yeah, uh, the wind was you know, horrendous, like I said, carried on. And we've got to pack up to get to a ferry. Nigel put the uh gear in the boat, and uh, you know, Sue and uh, Sue was there then, and Steve got in the boat. He started rowing, and he's not getting anywhere. Sorry, I was in the boat, he's, he's not getting anywhere. Mm. So I said, okay, we'll get out. And we, the mold, mud bank was about a mile long, so we'll walk down it and then get in the boat at the end. So, you know, it's probably only then about a half hour, three quarter hour row. We was walking quicker than he could row. Yeah. You know, that's how strong that wind was. Yeah. I told you what it's like. So we get to the end of the mud bank and uh, Steve and Sue got in. They laid flat in the boat to uh, try and prevent any resistance i got on the back of the boat so he's got his oars electric mower a motor and me pretending to be an outboard as well yeah you know? and it took us an hour and a half Jeez. to get back to the bank but even that you know you know um we've won you know we beat the conditions yeah you know, you know? yeah that was all part of the adrenaline thing you know, you know so i get it mate yeah most people you know well, what you know but say so it was all part of it when you finally got to the bank you're losing the will to live i was knackered my legs were aching from yeah. pretending to be an outboard but we've done it yeah and then uh, say so when i was walking along that mud bank and i tripped over i've been foot. i tripped over barbed wire you know so you know remember they flooded it it was actually the top uh, row of barbed wire of, of a fence. Yeah, you know, so the mud had gone up like three, four foot, and I cut all my foot as well. But the worst one was um, on that trip out in the island. I trod on uh, some broken glass. Oh no! Yeah, you know, really cut my foot open. And no, I said we have to go to the hospital. I said I ain't going to the hospital. <laughs> Fuck it. I said sew it up. Sew it up. You know, was so, it that bad? So I got some milk link out. And he stuck the needle in without much care. I go, oh! And that bastard looked me in the eyes. He said, Kevin, pain is relative. I thought, oh, I never made another noise while he sewed that up, I tell you. <laughs> yeah. And that's what I mean by what a great person he was to fish with. You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he made you, you know, because yeah. if you're competitive, you ain't going to let him get away with nah, it. Yeah. And to say that you're a wuss for, sh- you know, for screaming a bit of pain, yeah. which is really what he was saying. Yeah. 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 I wasn't going to let him get away with it. And that's why he's such, you know, he's such a great guy to yeah. fish with. He's so tough, you know. But, but yeah, um, so we're dealing with all this mud and, you know, so everything, it's mad conditions. Um, anyway, um, the next time we went back, sorry, I was just saying, yeah, so we put our rods out and uh, nothing's happening. So I walked miles, not miles, you know, quite a way down the bank and just put um, a rod out on its own. Yeah. Uh, we didn't have remotes then. And I walked back and ridiculous, I'd... I'd actually put it too far down. It was out of earshot. Yeah. Okay. And I just had an instinct. And I got up and I walked like 100 yards and I could hear this very faint yeah, alarm yeah, yeah. going on. So I shouted to Nigel, I've gone down there and uh, I've landed a carp. And so we moved all the gear down and that's – we had two nights left and that's that was one of the biggest hits we had. Um, I think we had like 25 carp in two nights. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was a massive hit. What size did you have them to on there, mate? Well, I say just over, just over just 40, 40s, 40s. Oh, you had 40s? Oh, yeah, just oh, over wow. 40s. You know, most of them are good 30s. You get the odd up at 20. But, a um, mix of mirrors and commons as well? No, no, that's a weird thing. Uh, I once took um, John Welsh, John yep. Welsh and Martin Gibson. Right. That's a baby brother of Jim. Yeah. Uh, and we went round to see, we put them in a bay. We went to Sam Man to see them, and one of them, I think it might have been a Martin that had a, uh, a, a common, I think it was like 30 pound common, only common I ever saw. 
Really? Now, interesting enough, where we put them is that same area where that huge common lives now. What's really? it called? Yeah, there? I know the big common. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, what is that? Is it 100, 80, yeah, 90? it's massive. Well, yeah. when it was put back in, it was like 80s, wasn't it? So it would be, be... Yeah, and I just kind of wonder if that's a common that um, uh, they caught, you yeah. know, because it must have been one of the originals. But, um, yeah, I wasn't really aware until, um, you know, I led now. Samir? Samir. Yeah. You know, become addicted with a place which is easy to do that... Um, there's none left. Yeah, you know, they've all, all died. You know, there's a huge fish kill. I didn't realise it must have wiped out virtually everything because it's all commons now. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah, yeah. mirrors, I think, are very, very rare. But like I said, I only ever saw one common. Wow. You know, and uh, you definitely haven't got the uh, numbers of fish like there was then. No. You know, but, but, yeah, so after that session, we decided to go back there. But now the, now the level's dropped, I don't know, I think about another 10, 12 foot. The island was, you know, was an island, but an island in mud. Um, so I think we ended up fishing, setting up like half a mile from that island. In fact, I'll never forget one uh, one morning, and uh, Nigel said, let's go for a walk. Okay, Nigel, so we're going for a walk. Just exploring, you know, it's, it's not feeding time. Yeah. And uh, we found this old, ru- this load of rubble, and there's loads of horseshoes, and we worked out it must have been a Smithies. Yeah. You know, and in fact, in fact, we took horseshoes back and propped us against our rods. And Nigel still has, um, I think, one of those horseshoes at least a Does day he? on, you yeah, know, on his, tacked on his shed. Yeah, but, that's cool. Yeah, but, um, no, so let's carry on walking. Okay, mate. And walking and walking and walking and walking. It's just like, you know, flat. Yeah. Mud. It's not, it's not really the sticky, sticky deep mud here. Nigel, what the fuck are we doing this for? <laughs> oh, let's just walk a little bit longer. Okay. And he's, oh, gone running forward. It's his fucking bucket. No. He's made me walk halfway across the lap to dead just to find that bucket that he lost. And lost. Oh, I just couldn't believe it. That is tight. Yeah, I just couldn't <laughs> believe it. Bless him. But yeah, um, it was either that session, this one, next one, never forget. Um, so we put the rods out, um, caught at night. And uh, I've got no rods left. You know, they've all gone off. And so I just waded out just, you know, until you know, we could get our lives together and think about the next night and just whacked a couple as far as I could. Yeah. In fact, there's a, there's a picture's meant to be iconic of me. I didn't even, you know, say I just stuck the rods in the mud. So, yeah. sting, you know, my bite indication was going to be when the rod got pulled over. Yeah. Um, and um, that changed everything because... You remember I said uh, craze until autumn. Mm. Uh, the mud was bright red. So the fish were eating the craze at night, but then they was coming in uh, to feed on the bloodworm in the day. Wow. And we did a, a three-night and we had 48 carp. You know, you know, so do your maths when you're in the average weight is 30 or whatever. You know, yeah. it just, That's a lot. Oh, it's mental. In fact, we used to have a thing that if we was getting, if we was getting ratty, you know, and grumpy, and the other um, recognise it. They just say touchy, touchy, and that bring you up. You know, that bring you up. You know, yeah. get your life sorted and stop. You know, taking it out on your mate. You know, and uh, we know you were both saying that, and it was simply that we never had a chance to stop and refuel. Yeah, just constant, just touching. constant action. You know, yeah. so you know, we it, that is it was that session that made me really realise that when you're Fishing at that level of endurance, remember, we're wading through mud nearly up to your knees, you know, and all the pressures of that, yeah. you know, not sleeping. And this is on top of, you know, when we set out we, you know, 24 hours before, you know, we've even probably got our heads down a bit, and then you're getting your head down for 10 minutes, and then you're getting takes. You know, that's when I really uh, realised and understood the importance of food. Yeah. So from then on, we used to deliberately wind the rods in. Yeah, you know, and make sure, you know, we got fueled up and there's some food in this. But, but you couldn't keep the rods in the water for an hour. Yeah. That's mad. Because it was bloodworm. There's on the bloodworm in the day and then at night, you know, um, it was a cry action, you know. Busy, mate. It sounds amazing, though. Well, to have that number of fish, yeah. you know, in, in just such a short session, I, you know, I don't know what that weight would have been, but it made Maddox's tonne up catch on the angler's mouth look a bit tame I would suggest yeah yeah it's a lot yeah how yeah. did how did you round off on there you I mean when was the sort of last time that you went 
And was it with Nige or did you subsequently go back sort of in the future? No, um, I think that might have been the last session, to be honest. We're getting, I think um, we fished well into the autumn. Yeah. Uh, as I said, and then uh, I suspect, I, I can't remember to be honest, uh, I suspect conditions went against us. Um, you know, winter's coming in. Yeah. Um, I had learned that it was a waste of time being on uh, Lactadere in um, anything other than really nice, sunny, well, summer. Um, it, I, str- I struggled in uh, early, mid, spring on there. Uh, we just couldn't catch much, if anything. And I think, you know, so much water being pumped into the... It took a long time for it to warm up. Yeah. So um, I think probably that winter come in, and uh, by then um, I'd moved on, I guess, you know. Mm. We'd done it, you know. Yeah, you'd done... Yeah, exactly. How often do you want to keep going and yeah. catching loads of carp? You know, ridiculous as it sounds. Um, when you... When we done what we'd done i i guess you could say we cracked it you know like you know it become it become a thing for us to catch the first night yeah 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 you got 52 miles you know we we was on it when we could go there and catch the first night and don't know, don't know how this is going to sound but there was anglers going down there for weeks and two weeks and blanking yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so that's what I mean by we cracked it, we sussed it, and you know, so the achievement to us was to catch on the first night. Yeah. And like I said, you know, we, we, we only did one four nighter. Yeah. You know, so he's going down for two, three nights and when you're regularly catching like that, you've done the job. You've done the job. You know, you're looking for a yeah. new challenge. So and, and I think that's probably what happened. You know, we just we'd done it. You that's know? exactly what you said, like your sort of pioneering spirit somewhere new. Mm. Once you've done it and you know the script and you're catching regularly, it's time to move on. There's plenty more waters. Yeah, there? me and Nigel were then, if you like, split up and did different adventures. I and mean, we went, I think you teamed up with Joe and started going to places like Kakistan for mm. the big cats and all that, you know. And um, yeah, so you know, I went off on my journey as well, you know. Yeah. So around the same time, so we're still sort of early 90s in that period. In terms of the UK, we've got a little bit of river fishing. You've got these trips that we've had abroad. Any other sort of focus UK-wise? I know business is busy. Anything else that you moved on to domestically? Snake pit ended. Yeah. Uh, like I say, we reserve that story. Yeah. Um, badly. Um, <laughs> I got chucked off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'm looking for new water. And um, I met a guy who... Very friendly with a guy who's running a an old iconic water in Cambridgeshire called Waterways, mm. and so I got on that, got Gary on it. In actual fact, I got Nigel Bovoy on it as well. Did you? Uh, yeah, for, for the English fishing he was doing. Um, yeah, this is it's actually someone's back garden, um, a bungalow or house on it. It was a bungalow. There's a house on it anyway, and uh, this intimate little gravel pit. Yeah, and um, next door to it was another very famous water. I'm trying to think what that was called now. Oh, dear. I can't think what that was called. But yeah, so there's two famous carp waters, I guess, famous because they held carp you know, for a long time. Mm. And we got on there. Um, that, again, really interesting. And uh, it continued my... mission to seek knowledge um you know i guess i guess wherever i was fishing you know i was thirsty to learn yeah you know, i remember um i started adopting this why right uh from waterways and there onwards you know why why mm. why were they doing that why wasn't i why was i yeah, and I really found it uh, an interesting experiment. You know, i.e. once you start inquiring and asking why, then it opens lots of doors of potential understanding knowledge. It also potentially, by the way, uh, causes blind alleys because <laughs> I had to go through this process. I'd answer a why, I'd say I've cracked it. Yeah. But actually I hadn't. 
you know, I'd gone down a blow my daddy. So you have to understand that. I hope this doesn't sound mad, but I don't know. but asking the asking myself the word why, I think really opened my mind to being able to learn. You know, and uh, yeah, so waterways. So um, waterways was really heavily weeded. Mm. So of course we're looking for the clear spots, as anglers do, and um, I've seen plenty of fish, but. I wasn't getting bites. Right. Why? Yeah. You know, I'm the bollocks. You know, I've got the rigs, I've got the bait, best bait in the world at this time, scope pit squid. Wherever I go, I catch. So why am I catching here? Um, I climbed a tree and I saw a carp um, pooding along over the weed, yeah. coming towards um, my clear spots uh, on these gravel patches. And it deliberately stopped, or veered course when it got to the clear patch mm. and went over the weed around them. And you know, I sat up that tree for a couple of hours. I saw several fish do the same. Yeah. You know, they weren't going near any clear spot. You know, and that was a kind of revelation, which might sound daft now, but no. remembering the learning curve of angling and carp fishing, we're talking, you know, the 90s now, not, you know, 2021. Yeah. You know, a long time ago. What's that, 30 years? Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, and it really had me scratching my head. So the only conclusion I could come to was, you know, I'm watching them. They're not going over the clear spots, but they're getting their heads down and disappearing into the weed. So we were on helicopter rigs. So um, I took I took the top bead off. Sorry, I slid the top bead up the line. Yeah. The, um, trapped it you know, by the lead. Yeah. And um, put a um, neutrally buoyant bait on. Um, worked out the weed was kind of three foot deep. And yeah. so I just, you know, chucked um, me rods out right over the weed with this weird rock rig which could slide back yeah. up the line. Yeah. And I had the rod tips quite high and got a take very quickly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, there weren't takes. The rod tip would just be going boing, boing, boing. Yeah. You know? And uh, that method absolutely tore what was apart. It's nowadays what they call a jod rig, I guess. Yeah, I suppose you it know? is. It is. You know, you know, certain people can claim it, bless them. But I actually wrote about that in uh, A Cart Fisher. Yeah. In fact, Jim Gimerson um, commented later in an article, it was pure genius, well, it wasn't, you know, but... but <laughs> I don't know, mate. In From that, that same, observation... In that same article, that article was three-parter. Yeah. I come up with three subjects and another subject, I because I then went on um, to using PVA bags. Oh, did you? PVA bags, believe it or not, were hardly used. Oh. And they'd only just... Um, they'd only just been become known and available in the late 80s. I remember um, Rod started selling them. Yeah. And also uh, uh, a guy called Andy Barker Tackle. He had um, right. he had a tackle business, I think it was in Coventry, Birmingham. Um, they both started selling PVA mm. bags. But very few anglers were using them for no other reason that, you know, they're so expensive. Ten bags cost you a fiver. Really? Oh, yeah, that's a Ooh, your beauty. Yeah. Huh? That is expensive. Well, that's, well, they are now, I think, isn't they? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but that, you know, they used to put a lot of people off to 10 cars. I'd done a fiver, you know. Um, and But once I realised, you know, this massive discovery, you know, you know, I can only say it like that, that, you know, you know they're frightened of fishing on the clear areas, but they're confident in the weed. Mm. You know, I really become um, obsessed with it. And so I started uh, putting PVA bags rigs in PVA bags and casting them into wee beds and, you know, and loads of fish, you know. It was real revelation, that was. And so I wrote about that in the carp fisher as well. Yeah. Yeah. Probably the first time someone had written about, uh, using, not probably, definitely the first time someone had written about casting baits and in PVA bags into wee beds rather than looking for the clear spots, you know. And uh, when the so-called chod rig, you know, eventually... Uh, caught on in its various forms, you know, and you know, it really was successful at the time. 
I, you know, I said right from the beginning, it wasn't the rig that was so successful. It's the fact that that rig was being fished in areas where carp anglers hadn't fished before. Yeah, yeah, know? yeah. Or if they did, they didn't present bait properly because that's a fact with carp. Um, they're, in, they're very easy to catch if you fish for them in an area where they've never been caught. Yeah. Um, I remember we used to fish a lake. We only fished at one end. We couldn't fish the other. We only, only fish half of it. Couldn't fish the other half. And then uh, we got access to the other half. Yeah. And we absolutely mullered it. You know, yeah. it was, you know, when we first got on there, we mullered them at one end, but they got really tricky. And then when we could get to the other end, we mullered them again yeah. because, they, you know, they hadn't been used to fishing there. And when you know, uh, we started fishing, for example, another example, float at long range. Yeah. Uh, Rob Mayling did that a lot, actually. Um, he did a lot of pioneering there. He actually got me to making some huge controllers, like three-ounce controllers. Where was that? He took them. Um, might have been Horton, I don't know. But again, you know, you, you fish for floater, fish for floater carp, you know, distances they used to be in fish for, and they'd be very cagey. Yeah. But get one out 100, 150 metres where they've never seen a floater before, and they're mucks. You know? yeah. And that's exactly you know, my view on why the Chodrick was so successful. Because, you know, carp were not used to being caught in areas where suddenly it could be presented. Yeah, you know, it was so, all clear spots in amongst the weed, not actually yeah. on it. So all that was going on at well, you know, again like Harefield, uh, Walter Waterways was very fertile for me. Um I was up a tree watching carp one day, um, you know, seeing how they was going down on, you know, my uh, what do you want to call it? Whatever rig you want to call it, early chod rig yeah. and that. And I saw one come on the margins, I had a margin rod out. And uh, I saw this carp come along the margin, and it straight away sucked me bait in. Shit, I started legging it down a tree, if you like, and I stopped because it hadn't moved. And so I watched it, and you know, it just seemed, it just sat there. It just seemed to be huffing and puffing. And then I saw the body come flying out, and it just waddled off. <laughs> Um, and I was just blown away. Yeah, I think I was mostly blown away by the fact it wasn't perturbed. Yeah, you know, I think that's what freaked me. You know, I remember saying it was an occupational hazard at the time. You know, it knew. Yeah, it sucked that rigging, and it knew what to do with it. Yeah, and you know, it just wasn't bothered. You know, he had the upper hand. You know, silly anglers, silly human anglers. You know, I know how to deal with them. You yeah, know. another one. And it just blew me away and. It really uh, was a you know, a moment for me, and you know, just couldn't couldn't stop thinking about it. Yeah. Why? Why? Why did it manage to do that? You know, because I'm kind of thinking the hook is a very low profile thing, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I come round to the key is the bait, the boilie. It's a bit like a balloon. Right. Yeah, you know, so I figured it was the barley that had enabled that fish. It was clearly rigged up. Yeah. You know, that's why, you know, it sucked in that bait, definitely straightened the hook link against the uh, lead, because, you know, it was now You yeah. know, it just, you know, then went through a process. And I just, why? How did it do that? You know, I had to know. You know, I had to think, keep thinking about it. And so that's when I come to the conclusion that the issue was the barley. Um, it was using the barley to rid itself of the hook. And we always been thinking blow. Yeah. When the Eureka moment was when I thought suck. Yeah. Yeah. And then I thought back to the original hair rig. We had it on the middle of the bend. Yeah. Okay. And we saw that lose its effectiveness. So if I can kind of verbally describe this. So a carp has pricked itself, right? It's hooked up. Yeah. Yeah. We just think blew the bait but no what if they suck it so they suck so they're then sucking that bait to, if you like towards their throat yeah? yeah and so they're sucking the bend of the hook towards them as well isn't they yeah like so a they're, or whatever. so they're pulling the point out yeah and then they blow and so that's I mentioned it earlier that's why when we moved the hair anchor point to mm. opposite the point of the hook on the shank 
they struggled more to get rid of it because then when they're sucking, the hook's pivoting, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. And so I put all that together, um, that the issue was the barley and the ability to suck it, to pull the point or loosen the point, and then they would blow. And that's how I come up with the blowback rig and the ring. So I needed a rig where when they went to suck, they couldn't because they've already blown. Yeah. You know, the, the initial yeah. reaction is to blow. So when they went to suck, they couldn't. Yeah. And yeah, the original concept of the ring blowback rig, I think, has not been understood by a lot of people. In fact, I had a bit of a row with Tim Paisley about it when he did a so-called version and he completely called it a blowback rig, but it wasn't, you know, he, he, um, he did a rig where he had the ring on the hair on the shank, but he made it a mono. So the ring would always go back. Right. Self-correcting if you like. Yeah. 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 And he made a big thing about it because, you know, he like so many uh, had this paranoia. Well, you know, what happens if you know, a carp come along and, yeah or a bream, you know, it wouldn't be fishing effectively. Yeah, you get it done, it needs to reset. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he had this reset thing, which completely missed the point, because mm. if they could reset it and the carp could suck it, the whole point of my original blowback rig was they'd blow it back over the eye of the hook. Yeah. And so they couldn't suck it back up. Yeah, they're done then, aren't they? They're done. Yeah. They're done. You know, and, you, and I never felt like um, you know, I lost opportunities, because uh, bream didn't really seem to... Uh, wrecked the rig and the carp only took it once and then I nailed it you know yeah so um yeah that was did before waterways and obviously the clear water the weedy environment how much in terms of observation in that environment had you done before because a lot of the waters that you'd done you'd seen I hadn't heard much of you sort of climbing trees and looking down on intimate spots like that they were quite they were sort of bigger waters if you like had you done much in this sense before not really. Um, mm. Yeah, you know, I'd done a bit in Essex. You know, I was in a, um, if there was a smallish water with a tree, with yeah. trees, I'd always be up. Yeah, but yeah. but there wasn't actually many opportunities uh, where on waters I fished. You know, Star Lane, for example, when I went on there, didn't have a tree on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you know, a new pits. You know, Silver End. Silver End, I did a lot of tree spotting, thinking about it. But a lot of my waters, no. You, know, yeah. you couldn't get up high above them. Uh, or the water clarity wasn't there, you know. But uh, yeah. but waterways you got me thinking now. Um, That's quite a pivotal. Waterways was, without doubt. Now you've got me thinking. Uh, the best opportunity I had to observe carp close up. A because it's completely surrounded by trees. Two because you B because you could climb those trees. C because of the weed, it was crystal clear. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. The other um, development that happened at Waterways was a riser pellet. Really? Is that where the riser pellet oh, began? Yeah, that was quite mad. Um, I'm not getting up there um, much. Me and get, neither me and Gary got up there for uh, a couple of months because we're just so busy work, at work. Yeah. yeah. Whereas Nigel did. And he got them going on charm. You know, again, weedy waters. You know, yeah. Uh, he absolutely smashed it. Absolutely smashed it. Um, me and uh, Gary have kind of agree with Nick, you know, the video guy, that we do yeah. a, a float of video. Okay. You know, because we knew it was a good float. Well, we've been catching him. Nigel goes on there so in the meantime, he smashed it. And um, so we've agreed to do this float of video. I spoke to Nigel, said, we're going up there. you be around. He said, no. Nah. He said, um, he said, you won't catch one on floater. He said, I can't get him to even look at a mixer now. Oh, great. You know, I've got to do this float video. <laughs> um, Gary, this is all him, uh, had the idea to take up a, a sack of very small pellet, you know, like two, three mil yeah. size. Um, I guess his thinking was, well, we can get him feeding on that. Um, then we might better, tr well, I know what I was thinking about it was, if we we decided up our plan was going to be the beach caster rig yeah yeah, yeah. Nigel hadn't used the beach caster rig uh we both knew how to use it particularly gary 
he um, he'd used it up back in Lincolnshire. Yeah. Uh, so that was our plan, thinking about it. We was going to get them hopefully on this uh, trout pellet and then fish some mixer on yeah. the beach cast the week. Um, so he turned up, got the sack out of the van, while Gary's sorting out the beach caster rigs, rig, rigs, whatever. Um, I cut the sack open and threw some pellet in, and I saw it sinking. I said, Gary, I said, what the fuck? I said, you bought a sack of sinking sink, trout pellet. Yeah. Tip and Gary said, look at the bag. It doesn't look so floating. And he did. <laughs> But it must have been a faulty batch. Yeah. Because it's sinking. Well, that's blown it. You know, make me doing a film. Great, got no boat. Great, yeah, great. Great floater feature. Great. But anyway, I looked at it and noticed that it wasn't all sinking. You know, enough of it was floating. So we took the view, well, you know, enough it's going to float. So hopefully you know, we might better get them up on this stuff. It was mind blowing. Yeah. I've never, ever seen anything like it. We'd, I'd started pulling it out. And within, I don't know, say minutes, say 15 minutes, whatever, carp start appearing on the top. But, you know, up until then, you know, carp taking float, you know, come up like this. Yeah. These were completely <laughs> head and shoulders, you know, just swimming like, you know. Yeah. Uh, parallel with the surface, with their heads and shoulders out, just troughing it. Hoovering it, yeah. Hoovering it, you know. And, you know, I... I I afterwards, you know, made reference to, you know, it's like the the surface is a mirror of the bottom. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, they was acting. They was acting just like I'm sure they would have done on the bottom, you know, feeding as they went along, you know, on the surface. I'd never, ever seen that way of feeding before. And um, we put the beach caster rig out and immediately caught one. Uh, but then, you know, this is a, a, a nice breeze the pellet I put out has gone beyond. Mm. And so the carp had gone past me. Yeah. So I stopped and they turned round and started coming back up the wing trail. So I've worked out, they vet it out and they're coming back up looking for more. Yeah. Okay. So we actually only ended up fishing one rod because one needs to feed and concentrate all the time. And it's, one of the most satisfying methods of fishing I know, the rise of pellet, if you, you know, if you apply it. Yeah. You know, apart from that, on its days, one of the most lethal, but I absolutely love it, fishing it static to um, a floating zig, for yeah, example. Yeah, yeah. You know, I don't use beach casting, we don't need to with the zigs, but it's about keeping them concentrated around that, you know, that static yeah. bait. And so, you know, you put some pouchfuls out, feed him, you know, around the area. But if you overfeed, then yeah. of course they drift away. Yeah. Okay, you know, you can't, it's impossible to get it all right. But So you're watching them all the time, waiting to them coming back up and trying to time the amount you put out to let arrive at where your static hook bait is, yeah. you know, when they are. It's an absolute art form. Yeah. You know? And it's just so enjoyable. In fact, you know, many a time I've just fed the catapult and let the other people catch them. You know, yeah. I just so enjoyed it, you know, and... Yeah, so it's mega. Um, but I say it was the reaction that blew me away. And I, to this day, I absolutely believe that, you know, that riser pellet, it's it's a natural imitation of a hatch to them, mm -hmm. right? You know, you see a hatch and um, stuff comes up and the shells uh, are shook on the surface and then you see elements of them drifting down. Yeah. yeah. So I think, you know, it was just purely that. The carp acted so naturally without any fear because they just thought there was a hatch going on. You know, and I think the rise of pellet is doing that, is imitating the hatch. You know, because yeah. it doesn't work on every water, but the first time you use it on a water where it does work, my God, you know, you're going to have the whole population feeding. And the other thing is, you know, I've seen anglers who just spot it out or feed it static that's not the way you, mm. know, you need you need a situation where a you've got a breeze yeah and b you're in a situation where you can you know really capture that you know in terms of the fishery rules or whatever where other anglers yeah. are because you want to go up 
you know, use a riser pellet to search the whole lake for you. So yeah. you can drift across and you know, find those carp. You then just come straight up. And then you can focus and concentrate the whole population of the carp in there and absolutely mull it. That first day, me and Gary had 28. <laughs> What a float of video that is, mate. Well, it never come out. I, I went I went back in an afternoon and the evening at 16. Wow. You know, uh, yeah, it's just, just we raped it, absolute rate. Yeah. yeah. It made, mm. as you say, it's such, I've had really good sessions on it. Fishing as a team with another angler, mm. either fishing static zigs or somebody fishing on a floater as it drifts out. It is, it's just amazing, even now, as you say. So back then, has an edge. Okay. Yeah. Faulty sack of trout pellets, mate. Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. well, I mean, we did, um, oops, we did a, a zig video. I don't know how much oh, yeah, of course you did. Was on the about DVD, five yeah. years ago, was that? Seven yeah, I years ago. that. Yeah, we went to um, a club lake and uh, it's ridiculous. You know, we didn't show half the fish. You know, yeah. at one time, I think I had two or three takes almost at the same time. Yeah, you know, that was the first time I'd really used it with uh, zigs. You know, you know, you just have six inches of the zig on the surface. Yeah. You know. Yeah, you know, it was mental. Yeah, you know, yeah. You know, what, what, what? That, what we did on that lake in a couple of hours, and we caught what the average club men were caught, caught in the season. Yeah, it it's just so effective. It definitely is, man. Yeah. So waterways, bless it. It was responsible for you know, the start of the blowback rig. Um, yeah. Uh, fishing in weed, PVA bags, chod rigs, and uh, you know, the riser pellet. Wow. So, so mega, really. I was only on there for one one season and didn't fish it after that. Yeah, you because know, it's working hard. That is some work. So, yeah, so I'd like I think, yeah, I'm a I'm at a point where I'm just just so hungry and thirsty and just thinking about it. You know, just so yeah. you know, like I said, yeah, you know, I'm just so on it. Yeah, you know, I'm just constantly thinking and questioning. You know, so, so yeah, it was the beginning, if you like, of the most major yeah. point in my life. You know. Yeah. You know, yeah, in terms of you know, productivity of information and putting bits of the carp jigsaw together. So now obviously 91, 92 waterways has sort of come to an end, as you said, after that season. How are things looking with Nash Tackle at this time? Um, I've got over my problems. Mm. Uh, I'm going to talk now for probably the next few years. I've got over my problems, um, head down. Um, I'm getting significant competition now. Yeah. Um, particularly from Fox. Uh, he he basically you know, really on it, much better businessman than me. Um, he saw the enormous potential, you know, of just really mimicking me. You know, for example, the luggage. You know, um, I think I'm, you know, I said, you know, I didn't really mark it up enough to you know, make right you know, right amount of profits so say for example I had a heavily padded um foam rod holder yeah. for seventy quid you know and uh, that was costing us say fifty quid to make yeah. um Fox went to China and uh, we'll get it made for like five dollars. Yeah. You know, so he become a very, very wealthy man out of it. Yeah, you know, that's you know still you know I'd set the price if you like. Um I was very patriotic. Um, didn't want to make in, didn't want to make gear in China. Yeah. Um, you know, very patriotic. Made in the UK. Um, foolishly. Yeah. Uh, probably one of the last to go over there. Um, but what happened in the end? I uh, had no choice because I just couldn't get. Um, yeah. Labour couldn't get machinists anymore. Women would have worked in factories. Um, uh, that declined massively, uh, and I remember, say, we was regularly running adverts and not getting any uh, women really? apply. But uh, a couple of miles away, there was a big upholstery factory that employed three hundred women. Uh, that closed, and I was so excited, you know, because you know, yeah. fish, you know, making luggage and all that, you needed heavy duty machinists. You know, there's, there's different types. You know. Women, my example, have been making blouses. Yeah. You know, and that's lightweight machines and lightweight work. They probably couldn't adapt to, you know, uh, sewing sofas together. Yeah. You know, which okay. are real heavy duty machines and you know, heavy chucking of fabrics about, you know. And then, you know, say the perfect scenario has happened for me. This, um, You've got 300 potential employees. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I put an advert out 
one applied and she lasted two days. Jeez. Yeah, and I've still to this day, where did those 300 women go? Yeah. You know, certainly not back into industry. Uh, we then, um, in desperation, I opened a factory in Norwich. Remember, you know, Dave Plummer and Richard Furlong. Yeah. Uh, well, Norwich was originally a centre for the shoe industry. And again, you know, real heavy duty machining. Uh, so we opened a factory there and Richard uh, managed it for me for a while. Uh, but then um, recessionary uh, times come along and it got a bit tough and whatever. Um, so sadly, I had to let um, half the workforce go, make them redundant. That couldn't and have been easy, mate. It never was for me, you know, so, you know, no. you know, yeah. how would I feel if I lost my job? Yeah. Yeah, you know, so I've always, you know, been sensitive to that, you know. But anyway, I had no choice but to let half of them go. Anyway, there was one girl who was leaving uh, the following week. I went up on the Monday to you know, tell them this. And there was one girl that was leaving the following Monday because she was pregnant. And, you know, the rule was, you know, first... Last in, first, yeah, first out. out yeah, you know, yeah, so yeah. so that in other words, I think there was about 12, 12 girls. So six of them, the last six that joined, would sadly be the ones that made redundant. Yeah. But if it was five, this girl wasn't one of the last six, but she's leaving in a week's time. Yeah. So obviously, I'm not going to sacrifice someone. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah for, for her. So I made her redundant. Next thing I know, she's gone to. Uh, what are they called? Tribunal? <laughs> no, uh, yeah. Well, um, what's the people you go to? Uh, I can't remember anyway. Uh, citizen advice. Citizen's advice. And um, I'm in a tribunal. Yeah. Um, reason for dismissal, pregnancy. Oh. Couldn't argue with it. No. Couldn't argue. Again, you know, me being the poor businessman I was, didn't, you know, didn't check out... Uh, the legalities. Legalities before, before I did it. So all that, can't get staff. Yeah. Uh, I'm being done over as well. Uh, mm. All that bit of taste, um, I went over to China. Um, was there a bit, and this is, get me, I'm not speaking out of turn or trying not to, but was there also a bit of you knowing you and having innovated so much tackle, having done so well domestically before this sort of movement into China, was there a bit of you as well that, didn't want to just sort of copy the guys that have potentially copied a lot of your ideas and go over to China? Was there a bit of pride in staying here and producing everything here? Well, absolutely. As I say, I was very yeah. patriotic, you know, you know, about making it in the UK. You know, but I was also, you know, later to find out, I was so wrong. Mm. Um, yeah, I think China had the reputation of Chinese gears crap. Um, yeah. And... With some justification then. You know, and it was no different after the war, you know, when J- J- Japan took off. You know, made in Japan, you know, meant absolutely yeah. rock-bottom quality, yeah. useless. But, you know, they got their act together very quickly. Mm. You know, and it was the case in China, not when I first went. But, um, you know, I once made the observation that, number one, ashamedly, I never produced the quality, you know, in my factory in the UK, including this room, like we could in China. Yeah. And number two, uh, the English girls wouldn't have done it anyway because they've complained about the weight of the gear. Yeah, and it was too much yeah. like hard work. Yeah. You know, um, but yeah, it was a bit of a mission. Um, yeah. I was lucky. This is where my engineering background come in, you know, because when I first went over there, um, I immediately realised the only way I could get quality was to look at their QC, their quality control. Okay. You know, so whereas other people, you know, weren't engineers, would have gone home and said, oh, yeah, they can make a bag, whatever. I really went into the factory's quality control, you know, what were their processes, you know, and all that. And so I think I was very lucky there that um, I quickly sussed that it wasn't going to be easy. Yeah. You know, and so to latch on to really, really scrutiny the, the quality control. Because the first time we went, we had an agent, what um, was that like the first trip out there, it's mate? It's mad, mate. It's mad. You know, so, uh, like I said, <laughs> it's just another dimension on the adventure. Uh, we had an agent. Yeah. Um, I don't know. How, it was a company in Kent. 
who used to supply pubs with ashtrays and things like that. Okay. And there was a young lad or the son of one of the owners who I think had an interest in carp fishing. And they approached us, why don't you make your gear in China? And so I went over with this guy, not the boy, the, you know, the, the uh, owner or manager. And then we re- linked up with a guy from, an Englishman from uh, Hong Kong whose wife was Chinese. He was English. And he was... Um, he was the guy who, like, basically the agent for this English company. Yeah, and yeah. He, he found the factories and whatever. Um, yeah, you know, I'm just blown away by yeah you know, this this place, you know, China. Uh, you know, it's just nothing like I've ever seen. Yeah. It's just a humanity. And you know, he he was, if you like, the um, you know, the Hong Kong guy. He was like the in with the upper rich okay. rich of Hong Kong. His wife's family were mega rich. Yeah, yeah. You know, so they're the royalty of Hong Kong. He was a member of the Royal Hong Kong Golf Course. Yeah. He's... In fact, he took us there for lunch. Um, I can't you know, remember the exact figures, but it was something like uh, 500 grand uh, uh, membership, right? And then like 200,000 a year after that. And that was if your face fitted. Yeah. You know, it was ridiculous, you know, and I remember it was, it was surrounded by tower blocks and I was told that each apartment was like 10 million, you know. That was the first uh, time I ate snake. You ate snake, Yeah, mate. I remember we served up snake for lunch. What's snake like? Um, stringy chicken. Is it? Mm. I made the observation, you know, I think so many of the world's so-called delicacies you know, just because like they're either they're rare or you know, it's oh my god, I'm eating snake. You know, nothing to do with how good it tastes. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, and no, I'd snake anyway. Um, so we sent samples of some of the bags out the holders, and um, off we go to this factory. Yeah, and um, we arrived late afternoon, um, and we was just. So gutted. Yeah. For example, um, the rod holders had put the pockets on upside down. Uh, you know, it was, it was an absolute mess. The gear, yeah, was, the gear was rubbish. Absolute shambles. But I never get driving back to the hotel. Um, they got the uh, agent. Yeah. Uh, wants to have a row with the manager of the factory, right? Because <laughs> yeah, he's made him look an idiot, and he hasn't followed. But it's surely his agent job to check quality. Yeah. yeah, so the agent, you know, give me the big and the other you know, factory owners an idiot. Anyway, he stayed behind to have a row with him, and so they saw this a taxi going back. And I'll never forget, we're going down this motorway. It's just been built. It's dark, so it's the street lights. But yeah, it's, you know, it's dark. But motorway's just been built. There's no traffic on it. Yeah. It was up until then, everyone had a bicycle in China, right? You know? And we're driving down this motorway, and this old beaten up taxi, and the taxi driver. Um, has got a torch out to shine it on his petrol gauge, right? Because he ain't got no lights. No lights, <laughs> mate. That's just where there weren't any cars, yeah? There's right. no lights. And he sees he's low on petrol. Yeah. So as he puts the torch back down, there's no floor in the car. You can see the road below. What? Yeah, yeah. I was with my sister-in-law at the time, Sarah, and she's one of these women who just gets in the head of hysterical fits of laughter in danger. Yeah, she's in fits of laughter in the back, you know, which is starting me off. You know, yeah. Anyway, he's pulled into this petrol station and he's left it running. Oh, he's filled it up. You know, God, he's obviously man. scared to switch it off. Yeah. You know. Oh, yeah, so, so, yeah. And then um, uh, it took us to a restaurant and... Uh, he turned up and they gave us a plate of pigeon heads. Pigeon heads? heads. Just the heads. You know, and, you know, and our, um, you know, so the manager, that's right, the owner had turned up at this time and he's ordered these pigeon heads. And he's got his chopsticks and he's like chewing the skin off this pigeon head. And me and what? Sarah looked at each other. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Did you have a pigeon head? Did you have one? Did I fuck. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And beaks and all. Beaks and all, yeah. yeah oh, and, mate. Yeah, in those days, it was an adventure of the food you had. Yeah. You know, there was, um, they've just starting to open so-called Western hotels. Okay. Um, and the nearest thing 
you get to Western food, might be some form of cereal for, you know, breakfast. Okay. You know? And so, and basically what we just lived off of was uh, the breakfast in the hotels. Because what I found was as soon as you walked into any Chinese restaurant, as soon as you smelt that Chinese food smell, it just shut my stomach down. Did it? Oh, yeah, shut my stomach down. You just, you know, in fact, me and Sarah, we went for a week uh, just eating cereal, a little bit of cereal and whatever, bread for breakfast. And then we was driving through Hong Kong. It must have been towards, oh, no, we was going to go from Hong Kong over to China. And I saw a McDonald's, stop! And we were so excited, but also very nervous. Yeah. And that's where I learned. Uh, anyone, by the way, this might be <laughs> might be worthwhile information. You can go anywhere in the world, and the standard of a, ch- of a McDonald's is very similar. Yeah. So yeah, you know, that's your you know that's your universal get out of jail free universal card. get out of jail free card. Yeah, and so and funny enough, that's the only time I've ever had a McDonald's in China though. They're quite rare over there. Yeah. Uh, there are chicken eaters. You know, so yeah. uh, Kentucky is much bigger. Than is McDonald's. KFC bigger than McDonald's? Oh, though? massive, massively big. But yeah, yeah, some of the. Food was outraged. You know, the first time I was taken to a restaurant in China, it was in Hong Kong, and there was a blackboard, and it said, speciality of the night, uh, dog in the pot. Ah, oh, behave. Yeah, first restaurant I went in. And another time, um, I was the honoured guest uh, of the chairman of this company. Yeah. And I uh, was taken to a restaurant. He, had, he had, must have had like 30 of his, you know, Staff there, you know, just yeah. just just us, and um, I was taken over to a fish tank. Yeah, and I had to select this fish. It was, it was like a bird, but it's like a, I guess, a nine ten inch long, yeah. like a double uh, depth feel. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Quite a narrow fish. Yeah, so I had to select this. Apparently, this was. Uh, a, a, a mega you know, rarity, the speciality. Oh my God! You know, I must be. You know, I was told by the agent. Yeah. You know, we are. You know, so honoured to be given this. He never can't, never goes out with customers. You know, but yeah, I guess they saw such potential in the Nash brand. Yeah, um, you've made it. Uh, <laughs> you know, Nash was known. You know, yeah. Um, you know, the one thing about China is I, I had instead of huge respect. Yeah. You know, Everyone knows Nash as a brand over there. You know, they used yeah. to come up to me and bow, oh, you know, just, you know, just to meet me. You know, yeah. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so... Um, so you pick your fish? Pick me fish off, it's gone. <laughs> Fucking hour late, I'm getting really hungry. You know, what's, go- what's going on, you know? And eventually, boom, these you know, doors open, the big hurrah music, and out comes, you know, the head chef with a silver tray with a plate on the middle and me fish. Mm-hmm. Wrapped in um, uh, cloth, like I simply said, and uh, he's put it down, taking the cup, and blah, and they went, oh, 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 all right, and then got any veg or chips with it? Just the fish. Mm. So, okay, so I've got my chopsticks, touched it, and its mouth went, oh, oh no. It's a special technique where they wrap the head and brains in like a cold towel and cook the rest of it, but it's still alive because they kept the, yeah, they, they can be so close oh, to the edge of Chinese. I could eat that, mate. Could, the, could you eat it? You don't have any choice, mate. Was it, was it any good? Shit. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> yeah, Brilliant. One of the reasons I think I got on so well in China is because I have respect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I know, everyone I talk, including Alan, you know, I talk them, look, you bow. You know, yeah, 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 yeah. You just show them respect, and the point is, if they put food in front, you've got to eat it because, yeah, in the Chinese culture, uh, respect is a, is massive. No, in the Chinese culture, uh, they have failed their guest. Yeah. If their guest doesn't enjoy or eat their food, I don't really know. The Chinese uh, at home eat rice at the end of the meal. Really? Yeah. I don't know that. They don't eat rice. And rice is seen as a filler. Oh. Right, so if you've eaten everything and you're still hungry, you eat rice. So if you've got an honoured guest, you're not going to give them no, rice, you're not are gonna, you? Yeah, of course you're not. You know, yeah. You know, so it's just understanding how they work. Oh God, some of the food you know, I've eaten there is. Horrendous. That sounds harrowing, mate. Yeah, yeah. If something's half alive on your plate and you're eating it, that's 
a long time. Yeah, you know, they used to serve it like a cow's head, and they would have split it down the, the skull down the middle. Yeah, you know, and the Chinese would be like digging in with their chopsticks, their brains, and all that. But yeah, you, know, you just had to go along with it. You know, yeah, you know, to a degree. Yeah, you know. but you know, as time got on. Uh, and they become more westernised, more restaurants opened, yeah. and and they got familiar with me. Yeah. You can fuck off. I want a McDonald's or a Kentucky, please. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You can say that now, but yeah, it's from a business point of view, though. In terms of, as obviously there was you were, you were successful. You got over the, the financial difficulty in terms of stuff in the UK. Still sourcing stuff in the UK. Then it goes over to China. What did that do? to Nash Tackle as a business in terms of profitability? It didn't increase it. No. Uh, because by then, everyone's there. And like, you know, the, the advantage, that, as I said, Fox had has been discounted out. Yeah. So margins have gone down to normal. Well, where the profitability, I guess, would come in, for example, I've got uh, this, this room full of machinists. Yeah. You know, uh, so... A lot of uh, I kept I kept by the way um, I kept this machine is going here for oh probably might have been getting on for ten years after I went to China wow. because we didn't have the Titans made in China ah yeah um yeah. it took took them years it took us four or five years to crack uh, making Titans in China they just couldn't achieve the quality uh but yeah you know, the 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 profitability would have come in, in terms of, you know, the burden on overhead here. Yeah. You know, less less staff and whatever, yeah. you know. And the wastage, you know, so you know, the point is if you're making, say, carols here, mm. yeah, you know, you know, there's gonna be an element of wastage which you'll never manage to, you know, really quantify and get on top. Whereas over there, please give me a corn a carol. You know, they've got to deal with the wastage. Yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. and all that. Um but it was a bit like Going to China then was a bit like I, you know, I explained you know, the revolution in England in the sixties. You know, yeah, music, car fishing, fashion, whatever. Yeah, you know, um, I think the first time I went, Tiananmen Square it was only six eight years before. People don't know Tiananmen Square. That's when there was a huge massacre. Yeah, uh, students uh, protesting, over a thousand were killed. But that was the beginning of the end, I think, for Marxist Tong and you know, the, yeah. the Communist Party then. Anyway, they have, uh, I think Nixon went over there. That's right. Uh, and ironically, with him being disgraced in Watergate, but he was the one who really started opening the doors of China. Yeah. And I always took the view that China closed shop on the rest of the world you know, you know, the century before, you know, maybe after you know, the Opium War or whatever, but you know, they didn't want people there. Uh, and I think they took the next hundred years working out how they was going to begin to dominate the world. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it was very clear to me that uh, the West had a big problem. You know, mm-hmm. um, you know, I always noted, you know, if you're hungry, you'll be successful. Yeah. You know, and if you look at the history of civilizations from the Romans to the Greeks, um, I just think they got too fat and lazy. Yeah. And that was a downfall. You know, and without doubt, the West is in that position now. You know, um, yeah. I think they estimated that China would be as big as the USA by 2050. Well, they're already much bigger. You know, and you know, say, um, the East is now going to dominate and uh, the West is going to become the poor relative. You know, the biggest thing, the biggest mistake was made was giving um, the Chinese uh, all our industry. Yeah, you know, without industry, you're not wealthy. Yeah, you know, and now they've got a spot to shorten Curtis completely. Yeah, you know, that's a sad fact. But in those days, I say, getting back to it, it was it was massively exciting. It was like going to the Wild West. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. You know, the scariest thing was the bikes. Yeah. If you wanted to cross the road, Jesus, yeah, you know, it was so scary because you know there were thousands of them. He was trying to find you know a gap to get through. You know, oh bloody hell! You know, it was really scary. That's proper culture shock stuff, though. Isn't well, it? I remember being on a, uh, crossing a dual carriageway, and I'd always been told this is cars now. You know, yeah. cut, uh, cars have uh, um, uh, followed the bikes, and they're making a the car like every second. You know? But <laughs> yeah. I remember being told just, just shut your eyes and go. Really, I'm gonna get run over. Zoom, zoom, zoom. Anyway, it's a dual carriageway. There's a little island in the middle, 
and I saw a gap, I got to the middle. Yeah. But I just couldn't see a break after that. Oh, no. Yeah, and my agent's shouting, just walk, close eyes and walk. I can't, I'll get run over. So he come over to the middle of the road and he put his hand over uh, my face and pushed me across. Joking. No, no. But, yeah, the first time I went to Beijing, like I said, it was millions of push bikes. Yeah. Right? You rarely see a car. The only cars you saw were taxis. Okay. And they, I think they've now, or soon after, whenever, it was around this time or sometime when they got the Olympics. Yeah. Green's yeah, getting the Olympics, okay. right? And they, the infrastructure is just mind-blowing. Now, suddenly it's all been modernised. Well, I saw them build the first ring road round Beijing. So if you like, the M25 round London. Yeah. yeah? I think now, like, they've got ten ring roads yeah. around each other. Yeah. Yeah, that's how many cars they've got. So for every bike, they've now got a car. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's absolutely mental. And I remember um, driving along the motorway past Shanghai. Yeah. And all I could see was, you know, the big construction cranes. It looked like a forest of construction cranes. And I read in a paper soon after that that 98% of the world's construction cranes are working in Shanghai. Wow. The whole world, basically, construction crane, chain, uh, cranes were in Shanghai. Yeah. It was mad just how it just took off and how, how excited the people were. Because remember, you know, Prior to this, they were yeah. oppressed in a, a horrid communist regime. Yeah. And there's as if their handcuffs were cut, you know, and they, they got freedom and they was allowed to, you know, taste, you know, some yeah. of the things of the West. Yeah. And boy, did they embrace it. Yeah. I remember, this isn't boring, is it? You know, there's nothing to do with fishing. Yeah. I remember we went over there one time. I was with John Walton, and a guy called Kevin Benham. Um, he used to work for me, actually. And the, uh, then basically took my ideas to Chubb, put all, your, put all your luggage in a cardboard box. But anyway, <laughs> um, we went over there and uh, one of my good Chinese friends, who had a factory, um, we got him to take us to this uh, fair. That's why we was going. It's called the Quanjo Fair. Right. It's basically uh, uh, the showroom. Anything made in China okay. is ridiculous. You know, we used to have you know, the ideal home exhibition. You, know, you get that in one little corner. Wow. Yeah, you, know, you, um, you go into one hall the size of, say, um, Wembley Stadium. Yeah. And that would be just full of um, cutlery, nice and forks. Then you walk into the next room and it'd be coal mining pumps, like, you know, as high as the ceiling. Wow. You know, yeah. Mental. Just you know, everything. Everything that Chinese made would be, you know, all the manufacturers would be in that show. And it'd take you a week at least yeah. to walk around it. You know, so you just used to, you had to focus on the areas you know, where, yeah, yeah. where you wanted to do business. Anyway, you went there and uh, that night he introduced him, me to a, uh, friend of his it was a young Chinese guy uh, probably about late 20s who he'd gone into business with with, in the textile business okay so and it was his birthday so um, he took us um, out yeah to to spend a birthday with them so this Chinese guy is there with like six of his entourage and we're we're in this dining room what what they do in China the restaurant's multi-floor, right? Yeah, yeah. The bottom floor uh, is, in essence, where the uh, peasants are low income eat, and there's, you know, various yeah. tables, right? Then after that, each floor is separate rooms. So if you've got a little bit of money, you have your own dining room yeah. and waiters for you. So we've got our own dining room. And um, for some reason, this... Uh, guy's birthday it was who said the business he thought I was fair game to take the piss out of right and so he's digging at me and taking the piss out of me all evening like and what I, I can't remember oh. but you know, you know he's a clever guy and of course all his entourage when he's you know, yeah, they're, so, on they're laughing as well you know going along with him and I've gone all the smiley face yeah going along with it yeah whatever anyway we then get to the end of the meal and they they served us these big like cream meringue things. Right. Yeah? And I, I didn't even think about it. It was just a, a natural reaction. And I just lifted it. And there's John Walters realised, and they've gone, no, I've just gone, 
bore oh, in his face, know. right? It's gone dead quiet. Yeah. Well, Kevin Benham is, you know, one of these people I just said laughs in adversity. He's burst out in laughter. So the rest of the Chinese did, which made him have to do it, right? Oh, God. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, yeah, it's a great, hilarious thing. I went back a year later and I was talking to uh, Hanson. This is you know, me, my friend who t- took us out the night. I said, oh, and I said, I remember that night in the restaurant. He yeah. said, yes, now, Kevin, every night. I said, what do you mean every night? He said, every night at the end the party, we boom. Because a Westerner had done it. No way. Yeah, yeah that was the thing. And, and that's, what, that's what the Chinese were like. They're just you know, hungry for anything Western. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, trendsetter, so, global trendsetter. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, just so crazy. You know, you know, I remember sitting on a wall in this city that had gone up in minutes. It was like yeah. something you'd expect to see in New York, all huge skyscrapers, reflected black glass, you know. And down the remote, uh, road in front of me um, comes a guy on his motorbike, right? Mm. With his wife and uh, a boy. All on the motorbike, wow. and on his back was strapped what looked like a an, a, an alligator, like three foot long. Yeah, and he's weaving amongst the traffic of all the mercs. You know, I remember another time seeing a guy on a bike towing a, a trailer. It was like only a metre square, yeah. and he had no walls on it, and there was a pig on it. Wow. Yeah, and the pig's looking around that was as if it did it's it every day. And he's weaving through all the mercs, you know, the brand new mercs and everything. It was crazy, you know, what you used to see. But again, I'm so grateful for, you know, seeing China at that time. Because yeah. now it's boring. You know, it's utterly Western. Like but, I said, you've got Kentucky's and McDonald's. Yeah, you know. yeah. It's just like, but could like, be a city anywhere in the everything, world. But as with everything, mate, you've, timing, you've been around at that sort of a massive revolutionary point with regard to industry. Yeah, I experienced Part fishing it. wise, we look back at parts one and part two, they're revolutionary times in terms of the, the fundamental stages of what it is now. It's a, it's a wealth of experience, mate. Well, like I said, you know, I'm just so grateful yeah. for the life that carp fishing's given me, the experiences, the friends I've got all over the world. You know, you know I can pick up the phone now. Hanson's still alive in Hong Kong. Oh, he's like, oh, come and stay. You know, yeah. Invite me to his mum's 90th birthday. You know, just like, I'm just so lucky. You know, yeah, carp no. fishing. But you've so, earned your look, mate. You've, you've done an awful well. lot, mate. Um, I think that's a perfect place to round off what is part four, mate, with the China sort of revolution. Cool. We will be back. A massive thank you to you, Kev, as always, mate. I've loved it. A massive thank you to all of you for watching or listening. Yes, thanks for listening, guys and girls. We will see you guys very soon. Cheers, mate.